Attention all reporters here in the media workroom. The breakout sessions have begun. The FAU locker room is open. And in just about five minutes, we'll be joined by the head coach of the Owls, Dusty May, in the main interview room. Zoom. Uh, it's just it's doing like it's a little dance. Uh, no audio for me. Uh, the moderator's on. Houston's on. Greg Miller, Denise ASAP, Olivia. Good morning. If you're joining us here in the main interview room, please take a moment to silence your cell phone. Please refrain from using any flash photography. No recording of video, no going live. Coaches' quotes will be available via ASAP immediately following this news conference. We're also going to have video available at ncaa.veritone.com. We'd like to welcome in the coach of FAU, Dusty May. Coach, want to give us a few thoughts this morning, and then we'll take some questions. First of all, we're very eager to get in the stadium with a few fans and bodies in here so it looks a little bit different than it has in practice just so we can get more comfortable with the environment. But we've had a great week of preparation, very impressed with, with our opponent, San Diego State, and the culture and the way they play. Um, so it's going to be a great basketball game. We'll now take questions for Coach May. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We have four microphone attendants. They'll bring a microphone to you. Please state your name and media outlet before asking your question. Ready for the first question for Coach May, and we have one. Let's head up that way to the right of the aisle. You can stay seated, it's okay. Thank you. Coach Robert Listello with Owl Radio. SDSU has been able to compete and win without strong efforts from their leading scorer and Matt Bradley. What does that say about them, and how do you prepare for a team that has different guys who could step up and take the lead role when needed? It's very similar to, to com, uh, competing against ourselves in practice. They've had four NCAA tournament games. They've had four leading scores. So they're much like uh, looking in the mirror and seeing yourselves, where we never know who our leading scorer is going to be. But when you are a leading scorer, you generate a lot of attention and help those other guys be successful. So once again, it's a testament to those guys being unselfish, uh, their sacrifice for the good of the team. So uh, we're prepared for it because we see it every day. We're, we're, it's like looking in the mirror. Continuing with questions for Coach May, if you have one, please raise your hand. Let's go over to 
to uh, about midway back on the aisle. Tom? Hi, Dusty. Tom D'Angelo, Palm Beach Post. Dusty, um, can you just talk us through, like, the process of yesterday culminating with the report that you're returning, which um, I think you knew for a while, but at what point, at what point did you realize this is the place and when you started getting the interest, uh, how, how much it all was attempting? That's a lot to digest. Um, it was never that tempting because of, of my affection for the guys in our locker room. Staff, players, support staff, everyone, our administration. Um, I learned a long time ago, you never mess with happy. And so I know what makes me happy. And, and right now, at this point in my career, I couldn't be any more pleased and, and uh, happy with where we are and just continue to continue, I'm just excited to continue building. As far as the timing, uh, nothing's changed probably in the last six or seven weeks. This was always on the table, but I felt obligated to focus on our season and our team versus all the other stuff, the peripheral stuff that goes on. And so it was just a, a moment where nothing's really changed, but let's go ahead and put it out so we know what our intentions are, even though nothing was done differently that yesterday, as opposed, uh, except just releasing what our intentions were from the beginning. And congratulations on that, Coach. Coach, are you ready to push our technological limits and try to take a question from Zoom? Love it. Here we go. We'd like to recognize Christopher Heidel from Herb FM and the Charm City of Baltimore. Chris. Hey, Coach. This is Chris Heidel from Herb FM Radio in Baltimore. Our class is on making the win, uh, making it to the Final Four. Um, hopefully, you win on Saturday. Um, just talk about San Diego State. Uh, what did they look like? And uh, did you play against somebody in the Conference USA just like them, or, had, or this is a brand new team? Probably the closest reference point would be North Texas, who we saw win an NIT championship last night. Um, they're disciplined, they're tough, they're together. I could go on and on with adjectives. They're all positive to describe San Diego State. It's going to be a, an extremely tough game. Um, but fortunately, we have seen teams with similar level of discipline and approach to the game that they play with. We have a question on the left side, just to the right of the aisle. Is that Luke? Isaac Bourne, Mid-Major Madness. So you've seen a lot of, Dusty, you've seen a lot of success in the Conference USA this year, especially with uh, Charlotte winning the CBI and then last night b both UAB and North Texas having like a great game in the NIT. So um, you guys featuring, being in the Final Four, what does that say to your conference? And, you know, what do you have to say to people um, around the world or around the country at least that – you know, might doubt mid-majors, especially from Conference USA? It certainly affirms what we saw all season long. Every night was a, was a battle, well-coached uh, teams with great players. Just happy that the, 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 nat, the nation can see what we saw all along because the, the, at Charlotte, UAB, North Texas, what they're able to do uh, in, in those moments was special. And uh, like I said, though, we saw it all along. Left side of the room toward the back, Billy, on the right of the aisle. Uh, Billy Witz with the New York Times. Dusty, last week in New York, you j just made a comment that um, your players were being recruited, you know, right now with the you know, portal being open. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you felt like that was kosher or if it's just sort of how it is in, in, in that world. To be honest, I feel like it's a non-talking point. There's probably not a program in our country at any level that's not – facing that obstacle in some way, shape, or form, whether – and it's not necessarily – I'm not being critical. It, it is what it is. If there's a player not playing at the high major level, then there's going to be uh, intermediaries reaching out to see if they would be happier coming down a level where they could play more and have a bigger role. Um, I wasn't accusing anyone. It, it, I never said the word poaching. I just said there are, our players are being uh, – there's a lot of avenues to get directly to players now, and there's – Third parties reaching out to coaches and assistant coaches to get them to, to, to change jobs. It's part of our, our, our industry. I, I thought it was a little bit overblown, to be honest. I wasn't complaining. It's stating the obvious. I think everyone knows that there are people reaching out to our players, to their players, to their players. It's just part of it. And like I said, our job is to provide the absolute best environment every minute of every day for our players. And if they want something different, then we'll support them and we'll bring somebody in that wants what we're willing to, 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 to offer. Uh, a couple rows back to the right of the aisle. 
uh, Mark Ziegler saying he's a union, I apologize, kind of a similar <laughs> subject. Uh, but do you get a sense that, you know, the NCAA came out with some guidelines about second time transfers, and it sounds like they have a little bit more teeth in it. Do you get the sense that people are going to respect those boundaries and that the players that might be being contacted right now are ones who would be eligible for a first time transfer, but the ones who would second time transfer are kind of protected? Or do you think it's just a free for all? A, a little bit, because there are going to be some constraints to, to, to be eligible immediately twice. But I'm also not uh, opposed to transfers having to sit out at times. Academically, transfers lose credits. It, it affects their graduation. It affects their life after basketball. So, and, and I don't know if I've ever coached a player that redshirted uh, as, a, as a high school senior incoming freshman or a transfer sitting out that didn't improve immensely and have an amazing experience because they're looking at the games and the process through a completely different lens. So I, I'm for both. I, what, whatever the rules are, I support them, and we're going to roll with it as they are. If you have to sit out, then we're going to bring you in and we're going to work like crazy to have you ready for the next year. And if you can play immediately, we're going to do everything we can to, to, to fit you into our scheme and our culture and everything that we do on a daily basis. So whatever it is, we're, we're on board. Coach, we're going to head to the left of the aisle. Uh, we're going to Dana on the left of the aisle, right there. Uh, Jane O'Neill at The Athletic. Jesse, you talked about their discipline at the San Diego State, but there's much about their physicality, which I don't think anyone can necessarily mimic on with their own team. How then do you prepare your guys for just how big, tough, strong this team is? I think you schedule the Tennessee Volunteers in the NCAA tournament and, uh, and, and, and do it recently as well. Uh, I think that helped prepare our guys. You can never be prepared. It's, it's a mindset. It's, uh, you know, our, our expression is you're either the hammer or the nail despite your size. And both teams are probably going to be the hammer uh, on Saturday night. So uh, we're going to have to do the best we can. But our guys, once again, if I'm, a, if I'm in a foxhole with anyone, I want to be in there with our guys. They're physical as well, as we've shown night in, night out. Uh, but hats off to San Diego State is, is to play with that physicality and level of discipline is, is truly impressive. Center of the room, third row. Hey, Coach Glenn Gilpo with Outkick.com. Um, do, do you feel less pressure or are you still getting a lot of requests for tickets even though there's a lot of seats and the prices have gone down somewhat because Texas and Houston aren't here? We try to eliminate the, the ticket distraction, any other distractions early in the week so our guys could focus on the game and whatnot. And, and uh, I know my, my wife, she's handling all that for us just so, so I can stay focused on what's important. Um, so we're, we're all hands on deck getting ready for San Diego State. Second row center. We're using that front right microphone now. Hi, Coach. Coy Wire, CNN. Um, you know, the program didn't exist 35 years ago. You didn't have any March Madness wins till a couple of weeks ago. Um, but it's been said, you know, don't call this team a Cinderella. Why is that? Take us inside that mindset. Well, I guess growing up, Cinderella, and I don't know if it's, it's something that I've said or what our players believe. We all, it's, it's a group think in our locker room. We're very like-minded, and, and we roll with each other's thoughts if we agree with it. And usually we agree with each other. But the term Cinderella has always kind of been that team that maybe uh, hit, a, hit a, a spurt late in the season and got hot where – they average five made threes a game, and then over the course of five games, they make 12 a night, or whatever the case where it's just more of a, uh, uh, a flash in the pan versus a five-month body of work. So I think when you look at our league, who we've played, and the way we try to schedule, even as difficult it is to get games, when you look at, at, at who we scheduled and then look at the preseason prog prognosticators, we tried to schedule teams that were picked to win their league. Northern Kentucky, who played in the tournament. Bryant, who we have a, a great deal of respect for. Eastern Michigan with Amani Bates. So when you look at, at, at our scheduling attempts, we tried to schedule as aggressively as we could to hopefully get an at-large opportunity. And so when, you have, when you've done what our guys have done with so much longevity and consistency, they don't consider themselves a, a flash in the pan. Left side to the right of the aisle, two seats in. Uh, Dave Hyde at the South Florida Sun Sentinel. Dusty, um, you guys played Miami, obviously the start of the previous season, completely different teams and all that. But what do you remember that game, and do you have any relationship with Larinaga? 
see Coach Larinig a lot, have a lot of respect for the way he coaches the game and the way he treats people. I know their staff well. We have friends uh, on their staff. Um, the, the thing that really stands out, it was early in the season, and it was, it was such a big deal for FAU to get Miami to come to our place. And it was a scheduling quirk where in year one they needed a money game and they didn't have their, their normal allotment, and they wanted us to come down and play. And, and, and basically I said, I won't come and play for that unless – you'll come to our place in year three. So it basically was a money game and a home and home that we were able to kind of squeeze in somehow, some way. And, and thankfully, Coach Laranega honored a contract after COVID and all that. But at the first half, we weren't ready for that moment. It was essentially uh, the same group for us. We were young. We were inexperienced in that type of uh, atmosphere. The second half, we showed a lot of great growth and, and looked like we belonged, and we made a play to tie it with just a couple seconds left, and Isaiah Wong hit a buzzer beater. And so we were disappointed because for 20 minutes, we felt like we, the, the stage was too big for us. We just weren't quite ready, but also those are the moments that prepared us this year and gave us confidence that we could compete with anyone, especially after them, they made the Elite Eight. Up front to the right, Eddie. Hey, Coach. Eddie Pels with AP. When you look at where your sport is right now with NIL, a bunch of questions about the transfer portal, do you, do you feel like there might be a, is there an urgency to sort of figure out what all these rules are going to be for the next four or five years so that, that everybody sort of knows what they're doing and they're on the same, quote unquote, same playing field? <sighs> I don't, I don't have a lot of urgency to figure out what trend it's going to go towards because I don't really have much say in, in those discussions. I don't have any say in those discussions, and I'm fine with it. I know what my daily responsibility is in the short term and the long term, and it, just like we tell our guys, let's, let's control what we can control and focus on what's important for us and our program, and, and that's what we try to do. On the right of the aisle, left side, just a note for our – our full court press guys with our black lanyards on. Your time's coming in the next few minutes, so let's get the blue lanyard questions in first. Brent Zorneman, Houston Chronicle. Nick Boyd told us that Bob Knight once got on you for taking notes during practice. <laughs> so do you have a favorite? I know you probably have a long list, but a favorite one or two Coach Knight stories. I have a, a thousand favorite Coach Knight stories, but uh, – the impact that he had on me as a teacher is something as a head coach I refer back to daily. Um, the way he cared for people, especially after they went through the program, um, is, is something that, that I try to try to do as well. When our guys are done, I feel like it's it's my responsibility to be them, be there for them for the rest of their lives. So those are the things outside of obviously the, the tactical side of the game, which Coach Knight was maybe the best ever at. It, it, it's mostly the other stuff. The way um, he poured into people behind the scenes, I think, is is probably uh, you know something that that I'm going to try to do. Hopefully, as my career progresses. Coach, we'll take some from the right side up front. Coach Ian Bethune with uh, SB Nation's UConn site. Can you talk about the impact that uh, Jalen Gaffney's had on your program since arriving on campus? Absolutely. There's three or four guys on our roster that, that they don't get a lot of the spotlight because their numbers aren't what some of the other guys' numbers are. Jalen Gaffney has brought a calming presence. He's brought a, a, a knowledge and IQ to our team, and we've all learned something from Gaff. Uh, he's been an unbelievable teammate every single day. He doesn't care about shots. He doesn't care about starting. He doesn't care about the spotlight. He just cares about being a great team at, teammate and enjoying this process. So we're, we're grateful that he joined us because when he came in, we told him we have every single guard back in addition to Nick Boyd. We can't guarantee you promise anything. And, and they, him and his family both said, whatever I earn, that, that's what I earn, and I just want to be a part of something uh, that, that you guys are building. And to the left of the aisle. Hey, Coach, Dan McQuaid. The Factor Media. Um, you guys have been using this uh, Wilson ball since the start of the conference tournament, I believe. Um, and I think you use an Adidas ball for your home games during the season. How much does it matter, you know, um, the different ball that you're using? And what's uh, what do you tell your team for the sort of different depth playing in a stadium like this? Well, our guys during COVID shut down. The gymnasiums were closed. There was nowhere to shoot. They would, we would hear stories of people driving by the local parks, and they'd be shooting in the park. And so we've said this is a lot easier than shooting in a park because a lot of the parks have double rims. And so the, it, it's a round ball and a round hole. We get a couple of days here to practice to get acclimated to the, the backdrop. But 
Once again, all year we've talked about things like if the shots don't go in, we have to figure out other ways to win. We're going to defend, we're going to rebound, and we're going to figure out ways to manufacture enough baskets to win. So that's been our mindset. If, if we shoot it well, great. We've done that a lot this year, but the nights we haven't shot it well, we've still been able to, to squeeze out wins. So that, that's our same mindset. We're welcoming in Florida State student-athlete Michael Forrest, and we've now reached the 1030 mark. So we're going to take questions from our full-court press program. That's the journalists with the black lanyards on right now for the next 15 minutes. We'll get one right off the aisle up front. Thank you. James Mueller. Uh, Dusty, what do you remember from the initial conversations you had when you were recruiting Brian out of the transfer portal, and what stood out to you about him? To be honest, there, there were maybe one, one conversation with Brian. Um, someone had reached out that uh, he wanted to stay close to home. He really had, had some family stuff going on. And I knew Brian when, he, when I was an assistant at Florida and he was in Gainesville. I'd see him around. I knew his family. So it, it wasn't a, a long courtship. It was basically one conversation, and it made sense for both parties, and, and it was done. If you have a question for Coach May or for Michael, please raise your hand nice and high so we can see you. We got a couple uh, toward the back. Let's bring that microphone up to them. We'll take one there, and then we'll take the second question. Hi, Coach. Uh, Emma Hutchinson with the Daily Texan. Um, just looking back at the career decision you made um, by taking this head coach position, um, are you overall pleased with joining the team and just kind of um, would you ever believe that you'd be here today um, at the Final Four? I never thought or dreamed this. It was always just do the absolute best job you can, get to the tournament, and then see what you can do once you're there. And our guys proved all year they belonged on this stage. So we had a lot of confidence. And other than the first day, I've been ecstatic to represent this university and be a part of this program. So other than that one day, so we're batting about 99.999% as far as me uh, being, being uh, the coach at, at FAU. Continuing with questions for our full court press journalists with the black lanyards on, same area of the room. Montredave, Michael, um, what was uh, Coach's pitch to you when he was recruiting you um, as a freshman to come to FAU when the program was in a different state than it is now in the Final Four? What kind of drew you to the program? Um, just how genuine Coach May was and truthful he was about um, all the good and the bad of the school. Um, he offered me an opportunity to play right away and learn from my mistakes. And um, that's an opportunity that a lot of freshmen really don't get. So um, I just felt like it was a great fit for me to, uh, to come with Coach May. Thank you, Michael. We're up in the front on the right side of the room. Raise your hand nice and high so we can see the lights are bright up here. Thank you. Hi, Talia Goodman. Um, Obviously, the first year that a three-seed or higher hasn't been in the Final Four, how do you feel like the parity in college basketball this year is affecting the game? For either of you. Um, Michael, you want to take that first? Um, I just say, it, if it, you can, sorry. Um, it just goes to show that, like, Whatever your ranking is really does, doesn't matter. As long as you're on the court producing and um, playing with heart, that's all that matters. My belief is that our continuity is one of our greatest strengths. Our guys know each other. They respect each other. And because of, of their relationship that's, that's been developed over time, they can hold each other accountable and know that any time they're being uh, corrected or even uh, criticized, it's out of love and what's best for all of us. So I, I do think that that's contributed to with, with a lot of new rosters bouncing around uh, for our guys to stay together and, and therefore uh, – they just they, they, they operate as more of a unit than a group of individuals. Coach, you recognize that last name, Goodman? I do. I know her father well. <laughs> Go Hoosiers. Up front to the right. Hi, uh, Sam Calhoun. Uh, 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 Coach May, you talked about the impact that Coach Nay had on you. Uh, have any other coaches uh, reached out to you uh, with advice about being in this position, being in the Final Four? Several coaches. I've talked to several. I mean, I've worked with a couple of Final Four coaches that gave me great insight and advice. Mike Davis and Richard Williams, uh, Indiana and, and Mississippi State. And then spoken with Brad Stevens, Bill Self. Those two gave me great advice. They've been here in recent memory. And, and Coach Self, I actually had a long list of things to be thinking about that I would have uh, it, would have never thought of any of those. So very appreciative of, of all the coaches that, that, I've, that have given us their time to help us prepare for this moment. We're going to the fourth row on the right side. We're going to have to pass that microphone in. 
suggestion for our full court press students as you guys continue to continue your career. Journalists that sit toward the aisle have better access to the microphone. Hi, right, Coach. Uh, Peter Rodriguez. Um, you mentioned, um, you know, Coach Mike Davis. You worked with him, um, with him at Indiana. Worked with him at UAB. But so what kind of impact has he had on your career? And has he, you know, have you talked to him at all throughout the season? I know y'all played against Detroit Mercy earlier this year. I talked to him frequently. I, I can't uh, stress the the impact he had on me as as a young guy, driving him on recruiting trips, listening to him talk to recruits on the phone, talk to coaches the intangible things that you don't get sitting in a video room or working players out or rebounding or whatever the case. So he taught me a different side, the, the human side, and, and really educated a, a young, naive, uh, aspiring coach from small town southern Indiana. So he, he, he taught me a lot about people. He's, he's very uh, – he, he just has a really a neat way about him. Michael and Coach, we're going to move all the way up front to the right. Uh, for Coach, uh, this is Manav Gupta. Uh, coach, you've had numerous experiences as an assistant coach, so can you tell me um, what you learned from those experiences, some major takeaways that um, helped you coach this team and make this amazing run? Well, I learned a long time ago that, that everything is about the players. You, you do everything you can to help them be the absolute best they can be, and you're always preparing, thinking in advance. And as an assistant coach, you're always thinking as a head coach without the pressure of, of – and, and responsibility that head coaches have. So fortunately, I've, I've worked for a lot of guys that encouraged me uh, to, to think in their shoes, even though I didn't have to wear those big shoes. Continuing with questions for Coach May or Michael. There's one. Jen, you want to come up and give him the microphone? There you go, right to the center. Great job, Jen. Great work. Uh, John Morgan, SME Daily Campus. A uh, question for you, Coach and uh, Michael. Uh, with the success of Conference USA in the postseason, seeing North Texas and UAB in the NIT, even Charlotte of the CBI, what do you think that says about uh, Conference USA as a whole? Um, it shows that the whole conference is, has um, can't compete with anybody. Everyone, the whole conference, the whole year has been just a dogfight. Um, every game has been competitive down to the wire. So it just goes to show that, like, Conference USA has a lot of uh, great talent. It affirms what we already knew, 20-game uh, slate in a very competitive environment every single night with great coaches and, and special players. So uh, it, it's awesome to see our league do so well when, when, the, when the lights are bright. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We have two on the left side. We're going to use the front left microphone, one, and then the second one toward the middle. Hi, Chase Hartzell from the Washita Sports Digital Network. This one's for Michael. Michael, you study engineering at FAU, and it's no secret that being a student athlete is a challenge in its own right. What have been your experiences and maybe some challenges you've faced both studying engineering and playing basketball at the highest level in college? Um, there's definitely been a lot of uh, <laughs> nights where you really can't, you don't get enough sleep, but you still got to wake up for practice the next day and uh, perform at your highest level. So. It really takes a lot of dedication to um, be able to do, to do both. So I'm just I'm grateful to be able to have the, the mindset to do both. We're going to go back to the center of the room. There's the mic. This is for both of y'all. Um, Michael, you're the elder statesman on this FAU team. Um, can you and Coach talk a little bit about what your leadership style has been in the locker room with some of the younger guys as you kind of navigate what's a new experience for all of you? How do you kind of, um, what do you say to them and how do you keep them engaged? Um, I try to keep them engaged by leading by example. So whether it's diving on the floor to get a loose ball or conducting myself off the court, like I just want the guys to look at me and be able to say that's how I should act 24-7. Um, Mike's made it very simple on us. Typically when you want to show a certain behavior or trait, you've got to pull up an NBA player or another college player. Every day in practice, if someone's not working hard enough, and a lot of times players don't realize that they're not working hard enough. All you have to do is, is point at Mike Forrest and say, if you want to know what it looks like, there it is. Because every single rep for five years, he's been the exact same person, given 100% effort every single day. So it's made, it's made our jobs as coaches much easier that we don't have to talk too much. We just we look at Mike and say, that's what it looks like. We have a question in the center of the room. We're going to pass that mic down again. Thank you. Coach, since you got to FAU in 2018, it's kind of been a slow build, kind of building this program almost from the ground up. You know, how do you, I guess, what are kind of the biggest steps and keys to building a program and getting a, you know, one small program to kind of where it is now? 
there's, there's so many people on, in college programs. It, the most important thing is getting the right people together at the right time. And we think a, a big a part of our success is we have a locker room full of like-minded guys that have very comparable work ethics, a very comparable work ethic, and they continue to push and challenge each other every single day. So we improve in workouts and practice because of their consistency, their, res- their, their respect for each other, but their drive and determination is probably our separators. Up front to the right, Ms. Goodman. Hi, Coach. Um, being in a bigger spotlight than this team has really ever seen, how have you seen your team handle that spotlight? I couldn't be more impressed with a group of young people, and, and, and we use the term change up, that haven't changed up one bit. They're the, the same. We'll walk out to practice today and they'll act exactly the the same way they did November 20th or December 13th, whatever the case. So, But I watch closely. We won 20 games in a row in a tough league against great opponents, and they never switched up. They worked harder. They were more focused. The the scout, their their preparation was impeccable. I I could go on and on uh, for a group of 18 to 22-year-olds to not change a bit except for the better when they were showered with attention and accolades that we had never received before. Up front on the right side. Uh, For Michael, uh, can you, uh, Michael, you played in, you know, huge games in this tournament. Can you tell me how you're able to keep your calm and just be relaxed in these huge moments and try and uh, do your best to deliver for your team? How have you been able to stay composed? Um, just having my teammates and my coaches um, always talking to me and just keeping me level-headed, that's really been the biggest thing for me. So I owe it all to them. Say Mary of the Room, one row back. Hi, uh, Hannah O'Gara. Uh, Coach May, in, how do you feel, in terms of talking about recruiting, how do you feel that this Final Four feature will launch your program's recruitment processes in the year to, years to come? Well, it, it, it exposes our program for all the good and, and, and all the things that go with it. And, and hopefully it, um, I guess, condenses the, the recruiting pool for, for the, the, the guys that are like us and, and want the things that we offer. So hopefully it just allows us to narrow our, our scope and, and focus on, on, on the guys that want to be a part of, of something like that we have. All the way to the back, all the way in the center. Uh, this question is for Coach May. Um, just throughout the years, you've seen like St. Peter's last year, and obviously you guys this year, and UMBC being the first one seed, and FDU this year. Why do you think these mid-major programs are starting to develop and go deeper and deeper into the tournaments compared to 20 years ago? Uh, do you think it's like a talent, uh, you know, the talent gap's kind of decreasing, or what's your take on that? Well, first and foremost, there's so many good players playing this game at our level. The continuity is important. But I think the biggest factor is matchups. You have Purdue, for example. We watched FDU beat Purdue. And on that given night, Edie missed some hook shots. Purdue shooters were out of rhythm for this, for this reason or that reason. And FDU had this, this, the, the quickness and, and the shooting ability and, and all those things that really just boil down to good players with a, with a very favorable matchup. And the determination is obviously a factor as well. We have another question in that same area. Is that right, Jen? Uh, yeah, um, you guys obviously played a very high-paced Kansas State team um, last round. So I'm wondering how are you preparing or practicing, if any, differently for obviously a much slower defensively-minded team in the SDSU? For our first practice, we talked about if we're going to be a championship program, if we're going to win a conference championship, we have to play numerous different styles, paces, and so we've, we've played North Texas, who th- they limit possessions, and we played UAB, and there might be 30 more possessions in that game. So we've played all different styles. We obviously love the up and down game, uh, but we're comfortable grinding it out and, and, and figuring out ways to score enough points to, to, to win the, the, the lower possession games as well. We have one final question for either Coach or Michael or both. Uh, Coach, your team is 29-0 and 0 on the year whenever uh, winning on the glass. And you mentioned the defensive prowess of an SCSU. How important are it going to be to win in that facet of the game? Utmost importance. If we can take care of the basketball, we can rebound it, then, then we'll have a shot uh, to beat San Diego State. We, we, it's been our focus all year. We know we're, sh- we're not as tall as the other teams. We may not be as long. We may, may not be as physically as imposing. But we do feel like we're quick to the ball, we're physical, we're aggressive, and we really have a strong desire to rebound it. So I think that factors in as well. 
We'd like to thank Michael Forrest and head coach Dusty May for joining us here in the main interview room. They're going to go out and enjoy some open practice time, and good luck tomorrow evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you. The FAU locker room should be closing about now as FAU heads out for open practice at 11. Starting at 11, the San Diego State locker room will open. The San Diego State starters will be available in breakout sessions across the hall. At 11.15, we'll have Coach Dutcher here in the main interview room. And at 11.30, he'll be joined by an Aztec student athlete for questions with our full court press group. Great work.
Good morning as action continues here in the main interview room at NRG Stadium and the Final Four. Currently, breakouts are happening with San Diego State Aztec student athletes. The Aztecs locker room is also open for student athletes who are not available in the breakout areas today. And we're joined by the head coach, Brian Dutcher. He'll be here from 11.15 until 11.30 to take your questions. Starting at 11.30, we'll get San Diego State student athlete down here with Coach Dutcher. And we're going to take some questions with our full court press program. Coach, want to give us an opening thought on today, and then we'll get into some questions. Well, I was waiting until there were fewer people here so I could say something controversial. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, obviously, part of this is the media, and uh, excited for the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, I had a good time with Dusty May yesterday. We sat impromptu before an interview, so I got to visit with him. Great guy. Share a lot of uh, the same things in the past. He was a manager at Indiana. I was a manager for my dad at Minnesota. He worked at Eastern Michigan. My dad was a head coach at Eastern Michigan at one point in his career. So there truly is only six degrees of separation, uh, especially in the coaching world. So it was great to spend time with Dusty and uh, love everything about him but his team. So hopefully we'll be ready to play them tomorrow. Coach, we're going to start with questions. We'll begin up front on the left side. Hey, Coach. Welcome to Houston. Greg Bailey from ABC here in Houston. In this rapidly changing world of college athletics, what does a young man like Nathan Mensa represent uh, in your program and maybe even in your life with his academics, the, the road that he's traveled, and the things that he wants to accomplish back in his native country? Yeah, Nathan's incredible, an incredible young man. He's been a five-year starter. Uh, he was on the 30-2 and two team, only started nine games, and he had the lung issue that shut him down for the rest of that year. And the interesting thing, he was going to come back for the NCAA tournament. He was timed out where he could do that and never happened. But Nathan has been in the business school. He's getting his MBA. He did a meaningful internship this summer where he's getting himself ready for the professional world. Uh, whatever Nathan gets, he almost sends half back to Ghana. So whether it's a scholarship check or whatever it is, Nathan is a giver, uh, still concerned about his family in Ghana, and uh, just a wonderful young man that represents himself, his family, and our program in the best way. We're going to go toward the back of the room, to the right of the aisle, about five seats in there. Coach Nick Lawrence from Mid-Major Madness. Speaking about Nathan, just talk about that matchup with Vlad tomorrow. That's going to be a really big one down low, really going to impact the game, in my opinion. Yeah, it's, it's going to be an incredible matchup. But, I mean, thank goodness we went up against Kalkbrenner. I mean, it's the same guy. Uh, maybe a little bit different skill set, but the same size, ability to score around the basket, physical, strong. So it'll be a challenge. And they have a really a two-headed monster. Rosado comes in, he plays different, he faces, he spins, he's quick. So they're going to be a real challenge guarding inside tomorrow. Continuing with questions for all media for Coach Dutcher. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Let's take one up front. Isaac Bourne, Mid-Major Madness. So I wanted to ask about your team specifically and how, you know, how close they are. And so what kind of created that dynamic within the team and um, how has that helped you guys this season? Well, it's kind of fun. We have a lot of older guys, obviously, fifth-year guys. Six-year guy in Seiko, fifth-year Bradley, fifth-year Arope, fifth-year Mensa. You know, we've got an older, older team. And the fun thing is to watch them kind of integrate the freshmen in, you know, have fun with the freshmen. And usually when there's that big an age different, they don't want a lot to do with each other. But they've really bonded. They have a lot of fun together. And uh, they're really a tight group. And we're, I say, Player-driven teams are better than coach-driven teams, and our seniors have stepped up. And a group of rope in particular, uh, Keisha Johnson doing a great job with leadership roles vocally. And uh, it's just been fun to watch them all come together. Center of the room, Coach. Justin Cox, Daily Aztec. Coach, what's been the experience um, being here in Houston for the team at, at such a big event like this? It's great. I told them there's a lot of distractions, but uh, a lot of great moments embrace all of them. But when it's time to focus, focus. And that's the same message every coach is given. It's no different than what Coach May's telling his team. You know, uh, embrace it, enjoy it. It doesn't happen very often. Uh, uh, but when it's time to lock in for practice or, or film session, you have to do that. And I said today, this is going to feel like an all-star practice, like your all-star weekend. But this is not all-star weekend. We're playing a meaningful game. We're not putting on a show. So go out there today, put a smile on your face, 
but get yourselves ready to play a game. And that's the difference. It has that festive feel, but at the same time, we're getting ready to compete on the biggest stage for the biggest title there is in college athletics. Coach, we're going to move to the back of the room toward the right side. Pete? Uh, Brian, Pete Thamel from ESPN. I'm wondering if you can just reflect a little bit on Mark Fisher coming here to, to join you guys and having him be at this Final Four, and obviously he's been through a, an unbelievable battle with ALS. Can you just re reflect a little bit on what that means, please? Well, one thing's for certain, you never have a bad day. I mean, when you look at Mark and look at his decade-long battle with ALS, how can you say you had a bad day? Or the game, uh, losing a game was everything, you know? It's basketball, and what Mark deals with is life. And ALS is, is unforgiving, it's cruel, and uh, we do the walk every year. I wear an ALS pin to every game to try to draw attention to the cause. And so I've known Mark, obviously I was at Michigan in 88, 89. He was just a, a middle schooler back then. So I've grown up with Mark, he's family. He's at, on the bench for every home game, Travelers ha travels hard for him now. But we got him out here to the Final Four because he's a part of all this. You know, not just his father, but him, the son, has been a part of Aztec basketball dating back to when we started all those years ago. Back left corner, we'll go to Lane. Four seats in, there you go. Hey coach, Lane Higgins from the Wall Street Journal. Um, you know, you were part of one of the first freshman led teams in the country with the Fab Five. And obviously there was sort of a rising tide of that for a long time in college sports. But if you look around at the teams that are in the final four today, it's not young players, it's older guys that have more experience. So, you know, do you think there's been a paradigm shift in what it takes to win in college basketball these days? Yeah, I mean, obviously when we won the national title in 88, 89, we had all seniors and juniors. The Fab Five, as good as they were, uh, Juwan Howard and Jalen Rose stayed for three years of college. Weber stayed for two. Those guys, this day and age, aren't staying past one year. And if they change the rule again, they might not ever come to college. So obviously, uh, the nature of the game's changed. How long players stay has changed. And, and it's, uh, if you can't adapt in this business, you're not going to make it. So we're adapting to NIL. We're adapting to the transfer portal. And you can't sit, sit there and say, boy, I wish it was the way it used to be, it's the way it is. And, and so I think I've had an ability to adapt to whatever rules are thrown at us change-wise, and we've been able to adapt and continue to be successful. Up front to the right of the aisle, Coach. Yeah, Dutch, uh, kind of a similar question, but uh, with no top 30 recruits, no McDonald's All-Americans in this Final Four, is that a blip? Is that a start of a trend? Like, is there any less importance on those top freshmen in recruiting those, those players now than before? I mean, you're not going to turn down a really good player, but they're not going to help you right away. It's going to take a while. I don't care who they are. It's going to take half a year minimal. It's the same thing when you take a transfer. Sometimes the transfer's got a lot of experience, but before he gets comfortable, like Darian Trammell's playing his best basketball. He didn't do that all year. He's doing it now. It takes a while to acclimate, and so it takes longer for freshmen to acclimate, and so to play the superstar freshman, uh, it's going to take him a while. And then if you don't play well enough, you don't get a chance to get to the tournament with him because you haven't won enough to get there. So I always thought Coach K did a great job because he coached in all those eras, you know, when he had all those senior teams and won all those titles, and then he did it with the freshmen. I mean, the guys he brought here last year is a testament to him how hard that is to do to, to coach freshmen at that level. And I'm sure if you were to ask him, he'd probably rather coach a veteran team. Who wouldn't? You want experience coming back. You're not teaching something new every year. But that's a testament to the job he did, taking both types of teams to this tournament. Left side, left of the aisle. Paul Garrison, East Village Times. Coach Dakari Allen tweeted out that Fish said, when one team goes, it'll be like we all went. Um, a lot of your players are embrace, your former players are embracing this run as if it were them who were experiencing it. I mean, how rewarding is it that the entire SDSU community is embracing your team the way that it is? Yeah, I've said this. A lot of players come back to their schools. They come back to uh, uh, the place they played, but their coaching staffs are four or five removed by then. They don't know anybody left on the coaching staff. It's a whole new coaching staff, but they know the facilities. They know the school. When they come back to San Diego State, they're coming back to their coaches. Coach Fisher's still here. I'm here from 24 years. Dave Velasquez, Matt Soria have been in the program 20-plus years as students and worked their way up. So it truly is coming back to your family. It's not just your university. It's the familiar faces you spend all that time with. And then we all share that 
uh, uh, vision of when we one, do, one does it, we all do it, and, and that is really exciting. On the right side toward the back, Chris. Chris Bennett with ESPN. Coach May was up here joking about glad they scheduled Tennessee when they did so they could get a chance to go up against the defense and the physicality. When you watch it, what they did against the Vols, what worked and what concerns you about going into tomorrow? They did a great job. I mean, they're well coached. They're talented. I mean, uh, they shoot the ball on an elite level. We can't let them stand out there and make a ton of threes. And if they do, they have to be contested. We can't do anything about a contested three. If we're out there with a high end and it goes in, then you tip your hat. But yeah, they're dangerous. And then uh, they do a good job giving enough help in the low post, shrinking in there. If you try to beat them inside, send a second defender in there halfway. And if you put it down, maybe all the way. So they do, they're well coached and they're disciplined on the defensive end. Coach, we hope to impress you now with the technology flex. We're going to take a question from Zoom Perfect. in Baltimore. Go ahead, Chris Seidel. Hey, Coach, this is Chris Heidel from Herbert Parent Radio in Baltimore. Congratulations making down to Houston. I talked to you after the, uh, the big win on against Tennessee. Uh, what do you see um, against uh, Florida and Atlantic? What kind of offense do they run? Is this somebody similar in the Mountain West you know, conference that you play on? We don't see it a lot here on the East Coast. We play some spread offenses. Jeff Linder does a good job at Wyoming spreading. Justin Hudson at Fresno plays four guards. So we play teams that spread the floor. You know, the thing we want to make sure we do is when a team plays four guards, they take that many long shots. Sometimes if you turn and just run into rebound, it goes over your head. So we make sure we do a good job of checking and not over pursuing the ball on a long shot. Left side to the right of the aisle. Isaac Warren, mid-major madness. Coach Dutch, your team is one of the more um, one of the more mature teams in this tournament, being in the fact that you know they're able to keep their keep defense up and is probably has allowed the least amount of points out of any team in the Final Four up to this point. So, what keeps them so mature in that aspect of being able to hold the defense down, even in games against uh, one of the best teams in the tournament? Everyone was saying in Alabama. Just our culture is such where. You know, early in the year we say we do a shooting drill and if we don't make those numbers in the shooting drill, we might go down to the baseline and do defensive slides instead of running it down and back. And to just say, there are going to be games where the shot doesn't go in as much as we're open. How are we going to win those games? We're going to win them with our defense. So it's just setting a mindset. You know, if we don't hit a number offensively, we'll do defensive drills. And it, it say, this is not a punishment. This is how we're going to win when no one else can. And so hopefully we can make some shots here where we won't put so much stress on our defense. But our defense, uh, it travels, it plays 40 minutes every game. We have a question for Coach Dutcher. Please raise your hand. We'll send the microphone attendant in your direction. Another question on the left, left side of the aisle. Coach, speaking about that age that you have on your team, um, multiple of your players have said it takes years to be able to fully grasp all the defensive things that you teach. Um, how much have you seen even, you know, these six years guys grow in their defensive game and what you guys are trying to do just this year? I mean, they're just connected. I mean, that's how you're, you're good defensively. You play connected. And so if a guy gets beat on a drive, you know, one guy will take him and the other guy will peel off. You know, very rarely do you see us with two guys on the ball. And that's where you give up threes. You know, whether it's a ball screen, we want to guard it two on two. We don't want to bring a third defender in. We want to stay extended to contest those threes. So we rarely have two on the ball. Even on a drive, if someone comes to help you, I don't need two on the ball, you break off and go get his. And so we work on it every day. We spend a lot of time on defense. And eventually, they start making plays where you're like, wow, that was incredible what you two just did there. How you saw that, covered for one another, yet got out on the shooter. So this is just the process that, you know, that the more comfortable they get, the more connected they get, the better we are. If you have a question for Coach Dutcher, please raise your hand. There's one on the left of the aisle. Is that Kevin? Yeah, Coach, uh, Kevin Sweeney from Sports Illustrated. Um, talking to some of the players about uh, Nate Mensa's impact and what it allows them to do defensively because of what he's able to erase. I'm curious, as a coach, what, what kind of luxury it is to have a rim protector like him who can also you know, switch and, and do so many different things defensively. Yeah, we've always managed to have a rim protector in our program you know whether Skyler Spencer I think still is the all-time block leader in Mount West history you know we've always had shot blockers 
and Nate does a great job blocking shots. And it's like the, the problem with having an older team, at some point they played so much basketball and they've been in college for five years, they're a little tired of college and basketball, college basketball. So they get disinterested. So that's the biggest task as a coach is to say, I know you've played a lot, but and, and you're looking at the guy you're playing, you still have to give the same effort every game. And sometimes they win and they just kind of get uh, satisfied. And the, the key to us coaching them is to say, you've been here a long time, you still have to put the same investment in because they played a lot of basketball and sometimes they're like, I'm ready to do something else in my life other than being in college and play basketball. And I know that seems interesting, but it's true. Hi, Adam. Talk about a guy that's played a lot of basketball and I'm trying to keep interested, Adam Seiko. We're joined now by Adam Seiko. We'll take questions from all media for the next two minutes or so, and then we'll, uh, we'll limit things to our full court press group. If you have a question, go ahead. Isaac Bourne, Mid-Major Madness. So, Adam, can you talk about Coach Dutch and just how the, his ability to be able to bring you guys together this season and just his impact for you guys? Yeah, he's been great ever since I got here. It's our sixth year together. You know, he got the job, you know, when I committed here. Um, it's just been a blessing to play for him. Um, you know, we've been to a few NCAA tournaments now. Uh, you know, come up short in those first round exits. Uh, but, you know, his, his growth as a coach, you can see from a player standpoint every single year. And he's a guy that, you know, with all our assistant coaches who, you know, are very passionate and, and get on us mostly, he keeps us level-headed, he keeps us sane. Um, and, you know, he just keeps us motivated to be better every single day. Uh, you know, especially here now, you know, we love all this stuff going on. But we understand that we have a task to get, uh, a job to get done. And he, you know, he, he embarks on that every single, every single time we're in film or getting ready to practice. So it's been a blessing to play for him, and I couldn't, you know, ask for a better coach. Yeah, I have a question for Adam or Coach Dutcher. We do have one in the very center of the room. We're going to use the back left microphone. Bring that over. Hey, Adam. Uh, what's it been like since you stepped off the bus at San Diego State last week uh, uh, up until now? Yeah, I mean, it's been crazy. You know, the city has been going crazy. Uh, it's been a blessing to, you know, win the Elite Eight, you know, be my little brother on the way to the Final Four. Uh, but this team is resilient. You know, these guys, you know, from August, from from Ju uh, July, August to the, the early early practices to, to now, our growth has been crazy. Uh, but, you know, we've just been pre preparing for FAU. You know, they're a really good team. Uh, you know, we're not looking past them at all. Uh, you know, we, we got better in practice this week, you know, got able to get in the arena yesterday, get some shots up, get our rhythm going, you know, prepare for them more. Uh, but it's good to be here. It's a blessing to be here. And we're just focused on this game for Saturday. Having reached the 11.30 mark, we're going to take questions now exclusively from our full court press group. Those are the journalists with the black lanyards on. But if you don't have a black lanyard, you'll have to reserve your questions for a later time. We'll have one all the way in the back on the left side, but to the right of the aisle. Hi, Coach. Um, Emma Hutchinson with the Daily Texan. Um, just what's it been like to have a player like uh, Darian Trammell on your team um, and having him come in this year? Um, just how has he done as a player and how does he um, just kind of build the team up? Yeah, Darian's like all players. He ran through a stretch where I think he lost his confidence a little bit. Question how we were doing some things, probably looking for more opportunities to have the ball in his hands like a lot of good players. But he kind of played through that stretch, that frustration, and just said, I'm going to do me. I'm going to be the best player I can be, regardless of what the coaches say. And he did that. He stepped his game up. He's doing it, doing it within the system we have, and I'm proud of him. To the right of the aisle, we'll go to Talia. Hi, Coach. Talia Goodman. Um, FAU's continued to talk about how they don't want to be seen as a typical Cinderella team. If you do see any differences, what are some of the things that you've seen from FAU that separate them from kind of that typical normal Cinderella team? Probably the fact that they're the winningest team in the country right now. They got more wins than anybody. Sometimes the Cinderella team gets in their conference tournament, they're barely above 500 and they make this run. They got more wins than anybody in the country. So we're not looking at them as a Cinderella team, winningest team out there. And, and I just told our team, their chip on their shoulder can't be bigger than the chip on our shoulder. If you're in our full court press group and you have a question for Coach Dutcher or for Adam Seiko, please raise your hand. We'll send the microphone stored in your direction, and we have one up front on the left. 
uh, Coach Tom Morgan, uh, SME Daily Campus. Uh, so you were last here in the Final Four about 30 years ago with those great Michigan teams. Uh, have you been calling on any of those past experiences to the team this week, or what's been your mindset of kind of uh, using some of that experience you've had in the past? I think I've called upon the experience just to help them through what this week is like, media responsibilities, when it's time to enjoy, when it's time to lock in, and just more experience from that regard. You know, the the demands are tremendous and they're fun. We're in love in every minute of it, but some at some point we have to go to work. Like I said, today is not an all-star game practice, even though it's going to feel like that. With fans in the crowd, they're going to want to dunk, they're going to want to do silly things, and I'm going to tell them, enjoy it like I did, but focus in. We have a game. We're trying to accomplish the greatest thing in the world and win a national title. So be able to flip the switch and concentrate when it's required. In the back to the left of the aisle. Hey, Coach. Nathan Sanji. Um, you had some close losses in the beginning of the season to tournament teams like Arkansas, St. Mary's, Arizona. What do you think your team learned from those losses that helped them get to this point? I mean, you learn more in a loss than a win, is crazy as that may or may not sound. We learn, we learn winning and losing, but losses shock the system sometimes. So change our offense a little bit after uh, Arizona. We've always worked on our presso and just didn't execute against Arkansas. And just little moments that you say, we have to fine tune this, we have to get better at this. And all those give us an opportunity to do that. Ball screen defense against St. Mary's, you know, which we've had great success with in the past. We didn't have as much success this year. What do we have to do to get better at that? And so they just teach you those little small lessons. Nothing major you have to tweak, but one or two things that can get you better. And we're willing to learn those lessons. Adam and Coach, we're going to go all the way to the back and all the way to the right. Hey, Adam. What was it like playing against your brother on the biggest stage? And, like, how cool is it that you'll always have that one up on him now? It was amazing. Um, you know, it's something that, you know, not too many people can experience if that. Uh, you know, playing him last year, losing in the first round, really uh, hit us hard. You know, the, coming up that next summer, leading up to this season, we were very motivated to make it back to the tournament uh, and make a run. But... You know, it's just a blessing for my family. Um, you know, Uganda, where we're from, you know, everybody supporting us. And, you know, he had a great season. Creighton had a great season. He played well. Uh, so it felt good. You know, it felt good to get our revenge back, especially to make it to the Final Four. And, you know, tell my family, one of us is going to make the Final Four. I uh, knew it was going to be me, but uh, it's, it's definitely a blessing to be here. And, and I'm just happy for him and the, the success they had this season. On the right side, to the left of the aisle. Uh, hi, Hannah O'Gara. Uh, this is for Adam. Being a vet of this uh, San Diego team, what kind of pressure do you feel tomorrow leading these guys and hopefully to victory? Yeah, um, I don't. I don't think there's any pressure on us. We understand that. You know, we've been counted out all year long. Uh, it's not a surprise that we've been counted out. And uh, these guys are more motivated as ever to get a win. You know, we have a great staff. Our coaches, you know, they do a great job scouting. Uh, our practices have been really good over the past few months. You know, we're really focused on getting better in practice. So we're excited for this opportunity. Uh, we're not going to take it for granted. Uh, you know, all our families being here, all the fans being here. You know, we've got the best fans in the world to support us, and their energy helps us. So uh, it's, just more, it's just more of a blessing, exciting moment for us rather than pressure. Yeah. Left side of the room, we'll go back to Talia, and this is going to be the front left microphone. Hi, Coach. Um, your fourth tournament appearance since starting at San Diego State, but your first tournament win here. Uh, getting this far, how important was it to get over the hump of that round of 64 game? Yeah, we want to win everyone we play. Obviously, we lost one possession game to Houston my first year. Bayheim rolled over me that second trip. Uh, we lost an overtime game to Creighton. It's hard to win a game in the tournament. So I didn't look back and say, boy, you messed that up. You should have done this better as a coach. You try to put your players in the best position to win, but I always say marches for players. That's not to excuse coaching, but if I put them in the right position, sometimes you live with a shot going in or, or ringing out, and that's March basketball. That same area, one row up. Uh, this is for Coach. Um, you know, this, this was your six seasons. I've been able to, I guess, build up the program to where they are now from where you were before, and uh, what, I guess, stands out to you the most about your journey so far? I, I knew I had to probably win right away, being as I'm coaching on Steve Fisher court. That's the guy I replaced. Mm -hmm. A little pressure to do that. But we had a culture. He left me a program that was in great shape. So I just continued to build on the foundation he laid that I helped lay with him. 
And so we built on a strong foundation and we continue to climb as a basketball program. We'll swing it over to the right side, just to the left of the aisle. Uh, Coach Dutcher, Sam Calhoun. Uh, obviously, you have a close connection with Coach Steve Fisher, and uh, he's been at that type of level before, uh, uh, b being the Final Four or winning a national championship. Have any other coaches like reached out to you, or have you received advice from any other coaches who have been at that type of level? No, not really. You know, most coaches will just call and congratulate. You know, it's not a whole lot. You know, here's what you need to expect. They know I've been to three of these in the past. Granted, it was 30 years ago, but they haven't changed a whole lot now that I'm sitting here. <laughs> the media responsibilities are the same. The practices are the same. So I'm feeling pretty comfortable. Now I've just got to get my team comfortable. That's the main thing. The press conferences are much more fun the last 13 years. I really think. enjoying them. To the right side of the aisle. Montreal, this is for both of y'all. Um, uh, Adam and you, Coach, you've had some of these guys be with you for a long period of time now. They've, they've done four years, maybe more. Um, can you speak a little bit to what um, some of them, Adam, Nathan Menso, what they mean, the program, and kind of how they've helped acclimate some of the new guys who've transferred in? Yeah, Adam and I have been together six years. I think when he leaves, I might think leaving too. I'll go with him. <laughs> we've had a heck of a run. So, but no, Nathan and AG have been with me five, and you know these guys are the backbone of my program to my era at San Diego State. So they mean everything to me. So Jordan Shackle, Matt Mitchell, guys that came my first year, you know, a lot of really good players uh, make a coach look good. And so I've had great players that have made me look good in my six years. We have time for one or two more questions if there are any. Let's go back. Uh, we have two on the board. Uh, this is for Adam. Uh, what experiences did you say you guess you had when you were younger during your childhood that shaped you into the person that you are today? and that have made you into uh, the player that you are? Man, that's a great question. I mean, so many experiences, you know, with my family, um, highs, lows, um, sh man, I could, I, could name a, I could name a lot, but I mean, the struggle we've been through, you know, living in hotels, um, you know, having to take care of my, you know, my little brother alone, uh, having to take him to the gym, having to get workouts in when we didn't have a gym to work out in, you know, everything, there's so much stuff that, you know, has motivated me uh, to be where I'm at today. And, you know, it's just a blessing from God. You know, my mom and my dad have raised us and myself and you know, my little brother, my little sisters into, you know, great kids and, and respected individuals. So, you know, shout out to them for raising us and, you know, shout out to Coach Dutch for allowing me the opportunity to be here at this, you know, wonderful university. And it's a blessing to be in the Final Four. Front left. Uh, coach, so FAU is a team that is 29-0 whenever winning the rebounding battle, uh, and that often leads to a quick uh, shots for them in transition. How much is it going to be important for your team to win that battle and hopefully control the pace of the game a bit more? Yeah, we've watched a lot of tape on rebounding, obviously. And like I said, when you have four guards and you shoot long shots, it's not like a lot of games where you're wrestling underneath the basket with other bigs, although Golden is big. It's those long rebounds that he bats out or that – you run in and go over your head back to the guard. So we've made a conscious effort to try to stay extended, just check instead of just running in, check and make sure our man isn't going and then secure the longer rebounds. Is there a final question or was that the final question? All right, one final question for our full court press, press group. Adam, you played against your brother last, uh, last week in the Elite Eight. Is he going to be here in Houston kind of watching you guys and what's kind of his message been is uh, how's it been having him along after playing against him just a few days ago. Yeah, um, he's gonna be in Houston. He just got him this morning. Uh, he's excited to be here. You know, he's very happy for me. He said if he's gonna lose to somebody, you know, he's glad it was me in, in San Diego State. Uh, but uh, he's coming with a few of his teammates, and so it's gonna be a good experience for them as well. Uh, and I'm just happy that we got to play him. I'm happy that. He's happy for me, and you know he's going to learn a lot from last game. You know, leading on into his career, uh, so it's good to have my family and him here. We want to thank Adam, and we want to thank Coach Dutch for being here in the main interview room. They're going to head back and get ready for their open practice. You guys take the floor at noon. Yes, sir. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow night. At noon, San Diego State has open practice and will also begin media activities for Miami. The locker room will be open from 
12 to 12.45 with student athletes who will not be featured here in the main interview room or in the breakout areas. At noon, from noon to 12.25, we'll have those breakout sessions right across the hall with University of Miami Hurricane student athletes. The starting five will be available at 12.15. We'll have Coach Laranega here in the main interview room for all media. At 12.30, we'll be joined by a student athlete from Miami with Coach Laranega, and we'll restrict questions to our full court press group. I hope you guys have been enjoying everything so far. This is Media Activity Halftime.
Try them one more, maybe take like one row back. I don't, I'm not really sure. You want them by him? It doesn't matter. If you don't mind getting the Miami logo, I can get
Good afternoon and welcome back to the NRG Stadium main interview room here at the Final Four. Next up, we'll have head coach Jim Laranega of the Miami Hurricanes. He'll be here from 1215 until 1245. At 1230, we'll also be joined by Nigel Pack. Nigel's currently in a breakout room across the hall for your questions and his answers. But starting at 1230, we're going to take questions exclusively from our full court press group. So 15 minutes with Coach Laranega and all media questions, and then 15 minutes with Coach Laranega and Nigel, and questions focusing on access for our full court press group. The Miami locker room is open. It has been open, and it will stay open until 1245. 
and breakout sessions are still taking place for another 12 minutes for student athlete interviews. If you're joining us here in the main interview room, we ask that you please take a moment to silence your cell phone. A reminder that this room is prohibited for flash photography, shooting video, streaming live, even with your mobile device. We'll have an ASAP transcript of this news conference available immediately after it ends, and video will be available at ncaa.baritone.com shortly after as well. Satellite information is the same all week and weekend. Galaxy 17, Transponder 10, slot A. The data rate is 11.914, symbol 7.2, downlink 11886.5, vertical. It's for the benefit of all of our news stations tuning in around the world and across the country. <coughs> Coach Laranega joins us solo for the next 15 minutes. Coach, do you have any opening thoughts? And then we'll take some questions. Well, after an exhausting day of doing media interviews yesterday, I thought our players did a great job in practice of putting the, the interviews behind and concentrating on basketball. We had a very nice uh, team event last night. We had a guest speaker, and he did a wonderful job. And, and uh, you know, hopefully uh, we'll have another good practice today and uh, a good night's sleep tonight to get ready for tomorrow night. Coach, we're going to take our qu first question from the first row to the left. Hey, Jim. Dave Borges, Hearst, Connecticut Media. Um, I know you've been asked a lot this week about the, uh, the George Mason game against UConn 17 years ago, but I wanted to know if you had any re recollection of the last time you faced UConn. Uh, few years ago, maybe maybe you've etched that from your memory, but, and, and if I'm not mistaken, were you, were you going through maybe some health issues at that, at that time as well? Um, oh, I remember we, we played in an ESPN event uh, in uh, Charleston, I believe, and we were awful, and UConn was dominant, and uh, uh, I had a back issue, and uh, it, it kept me in a wheelchair, actually, for a few days. Uh, I got that corrected, and now I got my 40-inch vertical back, and I'm doing good. Next question is to the right of the aisle, third row. Hey, Coach Greg Bailey from ABC here in Houston. Welcome to you, and congratulations. Uh, beyond the obvious uh, of, of getting to the Final Four with this group, what is the greatest gift that you receive from these young people day in and day out as part of this journey, and, and how does that help keep you so enthusiastic about what's going on around you? Yeah, you know, everybody talks about my age, uh, but my players, they don't see it that way. They might see me as their grandfather, but we have a great working relationship because they know I care about them a great deal and that I want to help them achieve their goals. And it's, it's for me just a great joy to have the privilege of working at such a great university. The university of Miami is paradise. You know, our campus is beautiful. And then to have such a great group of kids to work with who are just fun to be around every day. You know, someone asked me about the difference between I Isaiah Wong when he was a freshman and now. I said, well, the funny thing is uh, that young man has never had a bad attitude day or a bad effort day. He, he just has a great attitude towards life and a great work ethic towards basketball. And quite frankly, that leads to other guys wanting to be just like him. He's a great role model for the other guys. And you add North Shadow Mir, Nigel Pack, Jordan Miller, they're all like that. And when you have kids who are like that, it's really a lot of fun coaching. Coach, we're going to move up front to the first row. Dom? Yeah, uh, Dom Amore from the Hartford Current. Uh, Coach, from watching UConn in this tournament, uh, maybe in person in Albany or, or on film, what have you, have you taken away from them, not in the basketball X's and O's sense, but more in the, 
the vibe or the body language or the, the, the looseness, confidence that they've been playing with? Well, I, I've known Bob Hurley Sr. Uh, uh, since I was a young coach. I've known Danny and Bobby for a long time as well. And I think their team reflects the Hurley clan philosophy of play really hard and aggressive at both ends of the court. And you have to be impressed with their size, their physicality, but also their skill. You know, like Jordan Hawkins is one of the premier shooters in the country. And, and they have skills at every position. So my staff and I have been very, very impressed with them. And we know uh, we have a big challenge ahead of us tomorrow night. Coach, we're going to move to the right side, fourth row, AP. Hey, Coach, AP Stedham, AP and Kelly, as we see at Syndicated Radio. Coach, who was your speaker and why did you choose that person? And then you remember a name from the past, Donnie Lewis. Uh, Donnie, Donnie Lewis, who played with me at Providence College. Of course I remember Donnie Lewis. He one of the best. Uh, defenders uh, in college basketball at that time. Um, but uh, your question was about speaker, your speaker. Uh, our your guest speaker. speaker was Patrick Young, who played college basketball at the University of Florida, helped uh, the University of Florida get to the Final Four, and um, had a, a tragic uh, car accident, and right now is rehabbing, trying to go from a wheelchair to, to walking again. Uh, our strength and conditioning coach, Preston Green, uh, previously worked at the University of Florida, and Pre Preston approached me about Patrick maybe addressing the team via Zoom. I was all for it, and Patrick addressed the team for about 20 minutes last night after our team dinner. He did a fantastic job. He's a terrific motivational speaker. Coach, you're going to stay in that same area, one row up. Uh, Coach Dave Hyde at Sun South Florida Sun Sentinel. Since, since you, go, you went through that with Patrick Young, could you, what was the message he gave? Uh, but my other question, what do you do with the team the next, what are, you, what are you going to have, 36 hours or maybe not that much? But what do you do with the team? The, from the, I, from I, I, I want to tell you, I, I really liked your article. I, uh, you hung out with our guys for a few hours and uh, I think reported it very nicely. Um, what we're going to do is, is what we do routinely. I, I'm a great believer in routines. I try to keep it as routine as possible every day in practice. We have about 52 routines that we follow daily. And uh, we're going to try to do that. Now, it varies a little bit because we've added media responsibilities. But the moment uh, our responsibilities end here, We'll go out on the court and, and we will practice. And the practice hopefully will have a lot of energy and we want to get the players comfortable on the court and then also confident that they feel they can play really good basketball come Saturday night. And then when we're done, we'll do our normal routine. We'll have dinner together as a coaching staff and team. We'll have a team meeting. We'll go over all our um, last minute details about the game plan and then hopefully the guys will get a good night's sleep we have a shoot around tomorrow and then the game tomorrow night so game day will be very very similar to every game day that we've played so far left side of the room right side of the aisle hey coach josh good to see you uh, all week you've been talking about the change of venue going from 8,000 the watt holds to 75,000 just <laughs> just with the one practice how has your team adjusted to that simply because we won't be able to talk to you after practice? You know, I, I, I think they've done a very good job. We practiced yesterday in the arena, and it was a very um, intense practice. Uh, guys were aggressive at both ends. One of the, the group I would love for you guys to write about, and you should interview them, is our scout team. I, I'm telling you, they do an amazing job of simulating the opponent. It's, it's mostly a, a group of freshmen uh, with a couple of walk-ons. And DJ Irving, my assistant coach, has to prepare them for every nuance we're going to face, whether it's offense or defense. He's got to break down the video. He, he's got to study the opponent. Then he's got to teach the scout team uh, how to do it, how to execute. 
and then our rotation players, the top eight or nine guys, have to then defend the scout team and then try to score against the scout team. So um, they did a great job yesterday. They did a great job back on, on Tuesday when we practiced. And uh, I'm sure they'll do a great job tomorrow at the shoot around uh, because we, we basically do like a dress rehearsal. And when you have a great scout team, it north, often leads to great preparation and then good execution during the game. Coach, we'll take one from the right side, left of the aisle. Eddie? Okay. Hey, Coach. Eddie Pels with AP. There's been a lot of uh, talk about this Final Four and the seedings of the teams. Um, what do you, what's your general feeling about seeding? I mean, I, it doesn't feel like they got everything right this time. Oh. But. Yeah, I, if you're expecting uh, all four uh, number one seeds to be at the Final Four every year because that's where they was like, it doesn't work that way. There's too much parity in college basketball. There's, there's too many changes in rosters every year now. The transfer portal has created that. You know, we have transfers. Every team's got transfers. So even how your season starts is not really reflective of how you might be in February and March. And it's a impossible task for the committee to seed one through 68 and for everything just to fall into place. But what we tell our team is, if you've made the dance, if you're in March Madness as one of those 68 teams, you've earned your way in, either by winning your conference tournament or being selected because of your body of work. And it's been proven year after year after year that those seeds create the upsets. So a, a, a seed that's number one loses to a team that's a, an 11 seed or a number nine seed. To me, those are not upsets. They're, those are about matchups that happen to work in the favor of the lower seed for some reason. And I reflect back even on our run to the final four in 06, we were an 11 seed. We beat Michigan State, North Carolina, Wichita State and and uh, UConn, they were all seated higher than us. Coach, left side of the room, left of the aisle. Here. <clears throat> Daniel Gotero, KGU here in Houston. I'm, I'm asking you this because all your guys brought it up yesterday, but how, how would you say your dance moves have evolved <laughs> over the years? And uh, they seem very impressed with it. <laughs> well, Tremaine Price, who was my point guard back, back in uh, uh, my first years at George Mason, he was interviewed by the Washington Post and he said, my dance moves haven't changed, but they have gotten worse. And my players have said, you're, you're so stiff. Like, you got to loosen up. Well, I can't. I don't have that flexibility anymore. But uh, you, you guys can rate it or the players can rate it. I, I just know my wife likes it. Go to that same area of the room. Um, one of the things that's made this Final Four unique is uh, the lack of McDonald's All-Americans, the lack of consensus top 30 recruits. I I is that a blip or a trend to you? And are, are schools starting to devalue those top freshmen at all, more so than past years? Well, I would say this is certainly an unconventional group of four teams, only one blue blood in UConn. Um, so, you know, uh, the Blue Bloods get the, the McDonald's All-Americans. So if the Blue Bloods are back here next year, you'll have McDonald's All-Americans in the Final Four. But right now, you know, it's not that, that all the schools don't try, but you get eliminated quickly and the young man tweets his list of, you know, Duke, Carolina, Kentucky, Arizona, Michigan State, and then you're out of it. So you got to find other players you know, maybe your plan B is someone that's going to develop in your program and, and be a, a great player at some point. We've been very, very fortunate over the years to recruit a player, and I'll use Isaiah Wong as an example. He was pretty highly recruited. He, his, his list narrowed down to us in UConn, but, but he was not a McDonald's All-American. He was a young man with a great heart and a, a great competitive spirit, and he's just gotten better and better. And we're always looking for those kind of guys. And my staff does a great job. You know, Bill Courtney, who 
I hired at Bowling Green 26 years ago. He's now back on my staff in Miami. He's always telling me about guys that, you know, I'm hearing a great players. He said, but they're not for you. And then he finds a guy, he says, this guy's not rated as highly, but I think you'll love him. And one of those guys is Tony Skin, who oh, oh, I think, if I'm correct, we were his only scholarship offer from Division I. Tony helped us get to the Final Four in, in 06, and he's now the head coach of his alma mater, George Mason. He was named that, uh, I think it was yesterday. Dana. Dana O'Neill with The Athletic. A lot of people asking you questions about your relevance, your relatability, your dance moves. Um, I'm just wondering, like, have you ever been considered cool, or is like the art of your uncoolness sort of your coolness, if yeah. you will? <laughs> you know, I, I, I like self-deprecating humor. And when I dance, that's self-deprecating. I mean, it, it, you're, you're, I'm not Michael Jackson. Uh, so the whole idea of March Madness and the reason it's called the big dance is it's fun. Everybody loves dancing. Even if you can't dance, I know a lot of people can't dance, they love getting out on the dance floor. So for me, if I can entertain my players, bring a smile to their face or have them laugh, that's great, because uh, I, I got thick skin. I mean, I, I don't worry about stuff like that. Coach, back of the room on the right side. Hey, Coach, Will Manso, WPLG Miami. Good to see you. Uh, Coach, I think it's about a little over 40 basketball alum from UM are making the trip going to be here, a bunch of other football, other sports. What does that mean to you, knowing the guys that paved the way, and what it means to them, the pride they take in what this program has accomplished? Yeah. At each of my stops, Bowling Green, George Mason, and Miami, we've tried to build tradition where the players loved coming back and revisiting and, and sharing their memories. I just did that with two of my uh, George Mason players that were on the Final Four team. They joined us for breakfast. My uh, former assistant coaches are back here. And those University of Miami former players they can take great pride in laying the foundation because we didn't even have a basketball program for a while. There was no interest in basketball, supposedly. And then in 1985, we brought it back and we've had some tremendous coaches build the program and lead us to this point. I, I know Bill Foster gave up being the head coach at Clemson to come here and, and rejuvenate a, uh, a dormant program. Seth Greenberg helped them. These are guys I have great respect for. And then Leonard Hamilton, who's one of the winningest coaches in the history of college basketball, and is still, he's actually older than me, by the way, anybody don't know him. Um, and, and he's done a great job wherever he's been. So I, I feel like, you know, we, we want to keep advancing the Miami basketball program and compete uh, with all the best schools in the country. And, and those guys should take great pride in what we're doing and what they, they did. Final question of our general session is going to be for Dan to the right of the aisle. Yeah, Dan Wolgan, USA Today. I was just curious, how, how difficult is it for you to keep Coach Cristobal away from Norchad? <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, but I better start. <laughs> yeah, Norchad O'Meara is 6'7", uh, 245 pounds of dynamite. His personality, his body language, his, his, his ability to relate to everybody. You know, here's a young man whose first language is Spanish. And he's up on stage speaking English and still very, very comfortable and confident that he can relate to all of you. And like, this is his roommate. Just ask him what Norshad's like. And, and they become so close. And uh, yeah, I, I, I love them both. Yeah, and I ask that because obviously Miami's had one of the most famous college basketball. Exactly. The, to football conversions. He just seems like a guy phys who, whose physical profile, I was just curious, you know, what you think his professional future actually could be. Oh, he's going to be in the NBA. I'm telling him, in football, you get hurt. <laughs> I, I don't want him to even think about playing football, and I don't think he ever will, because he's a dynamic basketball player. He hasn't even scratched the surface. His offensive skills, as good as they are, can, can reach not just one level up, but two or three levels up. And we're going to spend a lot of time with him spring, summer, and fall 
leading into next season, and, and uh, you know we'll we'll see a much uh, much improved offensive play. How do you say that when the guy is already averaging double figure points and rebounds? I don't know, but he's just getting better and better. We'd like to welcome in Nigel Pack at this time, and we've also eclipsed that 12:30 mark. We're going to take questions from our full court press groups. That's those journalists with the black lanyards on. We're going to go to the right side, right of the aisle. All right, Coach Laranega, Sam Calhoun. Uh, uh, with UConn's big staying at six foot nine with Adama Sinogo and Dominic Klingon at seven foot two, uh, Norchad Nomir, uh, as he said, uh, he's so physical. Uh, he said that uh, ACC plays really helped uh, with preparing for guys that are bigger than uh, him. Uh, can you just talk about what Norchad's able to do with these uh, with this size advantage that his opponents have? You know, Norchad's uh, an undersized big man, but he's competing competed against big guys throughout the season. You know, Duke has seven, uh, two seven-footers in their starting lineup. Car Carolina has Armando Baycott. Wake Forest has some huge guys. Virginia has like 6'11", seven-foot. So he's faced them. He's learned how to defend them and how to attack them with his offensive game. And uh, it's a challenge. When I, when I see them walk out for the the jump ball, I say, oh, man, he's, the other guy's got him by four or five inches. And yet still at the end of the game, he's the leading rebounder and has scored double-figure points. So uh, I'm very, very confident in his ability to compete. Left side of the room to the right of the aisle, Talia. Hey, Coach, Talia Goodman. Um, both you guys and the women's team really took advantage of NIL when it was first introduced, and you both went on to, to make big runs in March. What are you seeing firsthand as the impact of NIL in college basketball? Well, I, I look at more as the big impact of the transfer portal because these guys probably wouldn't even been available if they didn't put their name in the transfer portal. And so when we are recruiting, we, we looked at our team last year, made it to the Elite Eight, and Charlie Moore and, and Sam Wardenberg were graduating. So we need to replace them. We needed a point guard and we needed a big guy. And when those guys uh, entered the portal, we went after them. Why they chose Miami, uh, I hope, and I, I really do assume, and I'm pretty sure I know, is because Nigel uh, saw the opportunity he had with Charlie graduating. Uh, Norshad, on the other hand, went to Miami Prep. So it was just a natural thing to say, hey, if I can come back to Miami, I loved my year at Miami. I'm a Span uh, my first language is Spanish, and, you know, the city of Miami has a lot of Spanish-speaking people. So for him, it was just a natural. And, and for Nigel, it's just a perfect fit. We're going to stay in that same area one aisle back. Um, Henry Huber with the LSU Reveille. Uh, in 2011, when you joined the program, it wasn't nearly as basketball-oriented, and uh, some even questioned the decision. Uh, what, what convinced you to decide to take on, the oper uh, or take on the challenge of coaching at Miami? Oh, my decision to come to Miami? Yes, sir. Well, basically, uh, I'd say from... Uh, very early on in my uh, coaching career, I had the goal of coaching, being a head coach in the ACC. Then having spent seven years at Virginia, reaching two Final Fours, that became not only a goal, but a dream. That was something I wanted to accomplish. And if I could ever have the opportunity, I was going to jump all over it. So in 2011, after our, our George Mason team uh, was in the NCAA tournament, knocked off Villanova, lost to Ohio State in the next round, and Frank Hafe left Miami to go to uh, Missouri. I thought to myself, that, that's the spot. I gotta figure out if I can get involved with that job. And I called some friends in Miami, and they helped me get an interview, and uh, the rest is history. I accepted the job and have loved every minute of it. Questions for Coach Laranega or Nigel, and if this one's not for Nigel, we'll look for a question for Nigel next. Chase Hartzell with the Washita Sports Digital Network. This is for both Coach L and for Nigel. As a coach and a player, both of you are respectively known 
for your energy and your passion for the game throughout the country. Who, what, or maybe even who was it that helped you fall in love with the game of basketball in the first place? Nigel, we'll begin with you. Um, well, I'm the youngest sibling in my family, and I'm one of the youngest cousins in my family as well. So all my older cousins and my older brother played basketball. So when I came up watching them play, um, I always wanted to be like them and play. My brother is nine years older than me, so he was playing, and I used to play against him all the time as a kid. And my cousins are a few years older than me as well, so um, I used to want to play up and play basketball with them as well. So, you know, wanting to follow their footsteps, uh, basketball became a natural habit for me. Um, I tried all the other sports, but none of them were as fun, and I didn't have the passion for it like I did with basketball. So basketball is the one I played, and I picked, and I ran with it. Coach? Uh, for me, I have uh, two older brothers. Uh, my brother Bob played at St. John's when they were in the top 20 in the country in 1960. I used to go to Madison Square Garden uh, to watch them play. Uh, my oldest brother, uh, Greg, uh, he also played in high school and loved the game. So those guys introduced me to the game, but the guy who really uh, lit my fire was my high school coach, Jack Curran. Uh, he became my mentor and inspiration for wanting to be a coach. And uh, he actually asked me to coach my freshman team, a player coach, as a freshman in high school at 14 years old. So from that time on, we went undefeated, won the city championship. So I think, okay, I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> Questions for Nizel or Coach Laranega? If you have one, raise your hand. Let's do one to the right of the aisle. Hey, Coach. Chris DeMond, Miami Hurricane. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk about the relationship between Wuga and Bensley. I know they have a, a special relationship being of the same year, and I know they room together. And also if you could talk about the jump that they've made from last year's tournament to this one. Yeah, I, I think the, the jump from high school to college is huge. In your freshman year, the first thing you have to learn is, hey, you actually have to defend. Mo most guys, when they come into to college, are terrific offensive players. And they have to learn about not only individual defense, but team defense, which they never really had to play in high school. I, I know that sounds ridiculous, but I've had players tell me, oh, I always guarded the worst player so I wouldn't get in foul trouble. They came in as freshmen, and the first thing that happened is Bensley Joseph immediately made an impact with our team with his great defense. I was like, wow, freshman that can put pressure on the ball. And so he became a key cog in, in our, our run to the Elite Eight. We'll go on the other hand, had a little further to go, but now is a tremendous defensive player. He's just gotten better and better, and both of them, as I said with Norshet, they have a very high ceiling. They're, they're such good athletes uh, that, that their skill level, once they really devote their time to the areas of the game that, that, that need the most attention, uh, they're going to be dynamite next year. Next question is left of the aisle, left side. Front left microphone. Uh, Coach, uh, John Morgan, SMU Daily Campus. Uh, you've been coming off of two drastically different games, one against Houston where you were 11-25 from deep, and then a comeback against Texas in which y'all didn't hit a three in the second half. Which type of battle do you foresee this upcoming game against UConn being? Uh, whichever works. You know, it, it's very, very simple. Uh, I, when, we, when we played Houston, the, these guys, they packed it in. These guys had to make some, some threes. They did. They made 11. But against Texas, they were out there strangling our three-point shooters. So what did we do? We attacked the rim and got to the foul line, made 28 free throws. So there, I love when we have a balance in our offense. I love when Nigel's making threes, Zay is making threes, Wooga's making threes. But then also Norshad is getting layups and dunks and Jordan Miller the same thing. Uh, because to us, they're... they're to play at your best, we need four or five guys in double figures. And we've had that for most of the season. Hopefully we'll have that tomorrow. To the right of the aisle. Uh, this is for Coach. Um, in 2006, you had the great run to the Final Four. So can you tell me what um, experiences you learned from that? And um, just in uh, for finishing the job this time, what um, takeaways did you have from that previous run that you can learn? Well, I've told, I told the players, wait until you see the stadium you're playing in because it's elevated, it's humongous, and how was it yesterday? It was pretty good. 
they, they see for the first time, it's just a, a different environment. It's like you're playing outdoors. And, and back then uh, in 06, we had our tallest starter was 6'7". This year's team tallest starter is 6'7". And, and those, those five guys really shared the ball. These five guys, actually eight, nine guys, really share the ball extremely well. And that's the, the most consistent thing. That's where the similarities are. You're playing in a gigantic venue. You, you're not even going to be able to hear me. I, I whistle very loud. You're not even going to be able to hear that uh, because it's, it's such a large venue and the ceiling is so high. But, but the, the consistency is really with how well guys play together. We'll go back to Talia on the right of the aisle. Nigel, your official statement on the venue was pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody got that? <laughs> hey, Nigel, um, you make this big life decision last year to transfer, come to Miami. You come to Miami, now you're here at the Final Four. What's it been like for you? What's been going through your head this past week just throughout this experience? Yeah, I mean, everybody's been telling me to, to soak it all in. You know, enjoy the experience while you have it. Um, it's, it's been so much fun, you know, playing with this team. Um, the things that we've been able to complete and accomplish as a team has been great, but it doesn't even feel real yet. Like, you know, we have accomplished some great things. Uh, we're here to make it to the Final Four, but I just feel like the true energy and the true shining we won't show until we're holding up that national championship trophy. We'll take the final question about four rows in that same area. Um, this is for Coach. Um, the adjustment from the CAA to the ACC is obviously a tough one. Um, what were the biggest things you learned from those first few years with um, with Miami that eventually allowed you to have this recent success? Well, the fact of the matter is I, I really didn't make any changes. My philosophy has always been the same. My relationship with the players have always been the same. Uh, offense and defense just varies based on our personnel. Uh, we've just always tried to create a family atmosphere. We started doing that day one in 2011, and it continues to this day. The, it's, it's really the people that we recruit. Like Nigel's such a great guy, such a great teammate, so, so passionate about basketball, and he's so skillful. So not, not only does he have skills to play it, but he has the right attitude and approach, the right commitment, and, and he's a great leader, whether it's on the court or off the court. He's always speaking positively and being upbeat, and his, his teammates follow suit. We'd like to thank Coach Laranega and Nigel Pack for joining us here in the main interview room. They're going to head back to their locker room oh. and get ready to take the floor for open practice at 1 o'clock. UConn media activities begin at 1 o'clock as well as Miami takes the floor for open practice. At 1 p.m., UConn will have their locker room open. They'll be open from 1 to 1.45. Student-athlete interviews for those student-athletes that aren't going to be in the breakout sessions and will not be down here in the main interview room. UConn breakout sessions for student-athletes from 1 p.m. to 1.25 p.m., That'll be the UConn starters. Coach Hurley will join us here in the main interview room from 1.15 to 1.45. The first 15 minutes will be for general media questions. The second 15 minutes will be exclusive to our full court press group, although everyone is certainly invited to stay. Thank you very much. We'll see you in about 13 minutes for UConn's open locker room. We'll be back in here with Coach Hurley at 1.15.
Some of my most favorite students. Like How's everybody doing? What did you do? I was trying to uh, write some citations. Yeah. What did you drop on yourself? Uh, one of those mustard pretzels, <laughs> which was going to leave a mark.
It's now 1 p.m., which means that the Yukon breakout sessions have begun with the Yukon starters directly across the hall from the media room. The Yukon locker room is also open for non-starters, student athletes who will not appear in the main interview room today, which will be one. And the starters that are appearing right now across the hall in the breakout room. So the Yukon locker room is open from now until 1.45. At 1.15, we'll have head coach Dan Hurley in the main interview room for a 15-minute question and answer period with members of the media. Our full court press program press conference begins 15 minutes after that.
Good afternoon and welcome one final time this afternoon to the main interview room here at the Final Four and Houston's NRG Stadium. We're going to have Coach Hurley join us from UConn in just a few moments. He'll be available by himself for 15 minutes to all media. Following 15 minutes, Andre Jackson Jr. is going to make his way over from the breakout area for questions from our full court press program with Coach Hurley as well. Right now, the UConn locker room is open and starters are available in the breakout areas for your questions. This note 
from UConn for everyone's information. UConn sophomore guard Jordan Hawkins was feeling under the weather this morning with a non-COVID illness and is resting at the team hotel. He's not going to be in attendance at today's open practice for UConn that starts at 2 p.m. And he's not available for team media activities today. So if you have any questions on that, please visit with Phil Shardis or a representative from the UConn media relations staff. But once again, UConn sophomore guard Jordan Hawkins is feeling under the weather this morning with a non-COVID illness. He's resting at the team's hotel. He won't be in attendance at open practice, and he's not taking part in any of the team media availability or activities today. If you're joining us here in the main interview room, please take a moment to silence your cell phone. Please remember, no video recording at any time, no flash photography while joining us in the main interview room. You're not permitted to go live with your mobile device or any other device here, no streaming. ASAP transcripts will be available immediately following the news conference, and video will be available shortly after at ncaa.veritone.com. In just a few moments, we'll have Coach Hurley, 15 minutes after that, he'll be joined by Andre Jackson Jr. We're going to do general media availability for 15 minutes for Coach Hurley. And then when Andre arrives, we'll turn things over to the full court press program. We're joined now by UConn head coach Dan Hurley. Coach, want to give us a couple opening thoughts, then we'll begin with some questions. Yeah, obviously, you know, in full uh, uh, you know, game, you know, getting as close as it is now, uh, obviously the anticipation, uh, you know, the excitement. Um, I'm just, uh, you know, excited to uh, you know, play a game versus a great team. No, we're going to have to be at our best. Uh, to, to advance and play for a championship. So, uh, you know, obviously we're, you know, get some shots today and, you know, all the preparation's in and it's, uh, you know, it's just time to go out and play. Coach, we're going to begin with our questions up front to the left. Go ahead, Dave. Dave Borges, first Connecticut media. Dan, I guess just how, how is Jordan kind of feeling right now? And, you know, what does he sort of have to do maybe over the next 30 hours or so to, uh, to be ready tomorrow night? Yeah, I mean, it's a... Uh, I think we've got like three doctors on this trip with us, <laughs> so you, you, uh, you know, so you hope that we can navigate it. Uh, we obviously isolated him. Uh, he started not feeling well last night, and um, you know, for him to miss today obviously tells you that he's he's not in a great way. But you, you obviously you hope that uh, you know you hope that we could that we contained it in time. We moved him out, uh, moved his roommate out, and obviously kept him away from the team. So. Hopefully it just doesn't continue to spread, and then hopefully um, you know, Jordan's good to go, or at least could be some, you know, some, or you know, give us something. Coach, we'll go to the right side of the room toward the back. Pete, uh, Dan, Pete Thamel from What's ESPN. Up, uh, obviously, uh, Adamas fasting has been something that you guys have had to accommodate for during during the tournament. And there's uh, just walk me through the variables of this specific tip time for he and the others who are fasting, and just what that's been like for for you to navigate as a coach. Yeah, um, you know, for me as a coach navigating, it was more like panic, uh, and I'm not very, <laughs> you know, I'm not, uh, I don't know much about like you know diet, nutrition, and and, and you know human performance. But uh, you know, we got great strength coach and, and uh, athletic training that you know been able to get up with him you know early and uh, get some food in him, and then obviously the late tip time helps us more. You know, it was a bigger challenge out west because we were playing so early and it was like really in the in the middle of him probably being at his weakest um in in terms of you know the, those things so i think it's probably the tip time is best case scenario for us coach we're going to go to the center of the room for zach zach the microphone's over your left shoulder now it's over your right shoulder 
you, Zach. Zach Braziller, New York Post. He's in the center of the room, front left. Zach, Zach and Zach's right there. Uh, uh, Zach Braziller, New York Post. Dan, what do you think Rick Pitino coming to the Big East does for the league, and specifically, what is it? What do you expect it to do for St. John's? Yeah, I think um, I, would, I would say not just St. John's, but you know, having a strong Georgetown and a strong St. John's means a lot. Um, it's great for the league. Um, you know, those games have been like, at best, quad two games, and at worst, quad three and four games. And you know, programs of that stature, in terms of the brand, um, you know, it's important. You know, it's just important for the overall strength of the league. I think it's going to make the games more exciting. It, you know, it's going to be more eyeballs on it. Viewership's going to go up. Uh, excitement for the games are going to go up. I don't think our league gets as I don't think the league gets as uh, as much credit as it probably should get as being. You know, one of the top basketball leagues in the country, top two or three every single year. But a strong Georgetown and a strong St. John's will help with that. You have a follow-up, Zach? All right, let's see. What do you expect him to be able to do at St. John's? It's obviously a very tough job. Yeah, he, he should, you know, it, it's uh, got a ton of, it's got an unbelievable tradition and history. And you got MSG and, and you have, uh, you know, a, a, a basketball-focused conference that, uh, you know, and obviously, you know, his background as a coach, I, I, don't, I don't think it's going to take him long to, you know, have them, you know, potentially back in this tournament, especially with how quickly you can do things now, the portal. To the left, to the right of the aisle, it's going to be Dana on the back left microphone. A lot. Dana O'Neill with The Athletic. Uh, Dan, your players talked a little bit about kind of they felt like since maybe the Big East from Eve eased back on them a little bit in terms of the intensity. Did you have to like? Did they have to earn your trust to get there, and, and or is that a, mo a feeling that you just get because of how much is riding on every one of these games? Yeah, I think it does become a, you know, it definitely becomes a trust thing when when you really believe in the group and you know they've shown you enough quality at, at both ends of the court and and on the backboard, and then you, you feel like they finally understand what your identity is, um, you know, and, you, and you've been through so many of these. Uh, you know, wars together that you, you know, generally I think when the when the calendar turns to March, you know, you really begin to back off and just make sure you keep your team fresh. Um, if you're still coaching mistakes this time of year, you're in trouble. So, uh, you know, it, it's uh, definitely got a lot of faith in the group. Left it's interesting side. they said that too, Dana, because I thought today's practice was probably a little bit harder than it should have been. Next question is on the left side, left of the aisle. Dan Joe's own Channel 3, CBS Hartford. Joe. Ten seconds left in the game. You haven't had to worry about it lately. But ten seconds left. You're down one. Who's your guy? Are you serious, Joe? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think the good thing about the group is we've got um, – you know, I, I wouldn't say we necessarily have a guy we could you know, give the ball to that's going to be a uh, – a breakdown player, you know, somebody you just, you know, a Kemba type of situation where you just kind of give him the ball and get out of the way and, you know, step back, party of Kemba. I don't know that we necessarily have that. I think for us it'll be, um, you know, who's got it going, who's got the matchup. And, and I think for us we're going to have to, like, execute something that we run offensively. That, that's kind of how this group is, you know, has been, has been designed. But we've got some guys, they're confident shooters. Obviously Jordan, uh, you know, you know, Jordan or, 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 or Joey or, you know, maybe Andre getting to the rim or throwing it to Adama inside. We've got places we could go. <laughs> Joe. Coach, moving to the back of the room, right side of the aisle, Aaron. Aaron Torres, Fox Sports. So, Coach, you know, as this journey's kind of progressed, I think maybe an outside non-college basketball person just assumes it's UConn, this is what they do. But, you know, for people who follow the team kind of on a day-to-day, -day, it's been a journey, it's been a process, and it wasn't easy when you got there. You know, with no disrespect intended to anybody that was there before you, can you just quickly tell us how tough it was? Because the, the program was coming off the back-to-back -back losing seasons when you took over. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it was a complete, uh, you know, just there was not much of a, a foundation left in place. Uh, you know, again, I think the, you know, you get that Ken Palm sheet, the, the first staff meeting to start talking basketball, and it's, it says 170. 
And then you start looking at like, who, all right, wait, who was 165 and who was 172? And you're like, the UConn shouldn't be in this neighborhood. Um, you know, and, and obviously it's, you know, it, it's culture, it's, it's, it's work ethic, it, 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 it's, it's talent, it's, it's rebuilding the psyche. And, and while you're doing it, you're getting everyone's best shot. You know, when, when you're rebuilding Rhode Island, uh, no, no, no disrespect, you, you're, you know, you're, you're not getting everyone's best shot. Even when we were down and you have UConn across your chest, you know, you're, you're still everyone's, you know, it's still a Super Bowl for the other coach and the other players because of the history and tradition. You know, so while you're trying to make that climb back up the mountain, um, you know, you're starting over. History and tradition doesn't help you win anything. It just probably makes your opponents want to beat you more, and it adds a little bit more pressure uh, going into every competition. So um, I'm proud of how we've gotten here. This was pre-portal. This was pre-NIL where you could just, you know, back then you, you had to develop – a culture, develop young players. Um, you, know, you, you couldn't, a, a recruit had to believe in your vision. You couldn't necessarily purchase it. Um, so, yeah, I'm proud of how we've gotten here. You know, we, we built a program and, uh, and, we, and, we, and we still continue to do it the same way. A majority of this team and a majority of our teams in the future. It'll all be young players coming in, developing, and then supplementing them from, you know, players. You know, from the portal that fit us, uh, not the other way around. Right side of the aisle, Billy. Billy Witz with the New York Times. Dan, after the you know, going out in the first round the last couple of years, it sounded like yesterday you had like a, I guess a serious self evaluation of a lot of things with in the in the program or just the makeup of the of the roster and what you needed. Is that something that you've you know, you would typically do every year, or was there maybe a, a heightened level of urgency of like, listen, if if we're gonna not repeat this every year, we really need to yeah. have a deeper examination of what what got us in this yeah. situation. No, no, yeah, normally I would take a couple of days off and be away from the team, and and you know, take probably more time to think things through. But coming out of that New Mexico State game again, yeah, the, the COVID year. Back in that bubble, that, that was a different type of experience than uh, you could possibly imagine if you weren't involved in that situation. So, you know, that, that was, uh, uh, to me, a one-off situation. But I, I don't uh, – last year, um, I just – we felt the flaws in roster construction, really, in terms of how we put the group together. So that – really, that, that Monday, I, I was in the office, you know, at 7 a.m., ready to meet with the staff, ready to meet with – with with the players and I knew exactly what everyone's role needed to be I knew exactly what we needed to get in the portal we just we had to get better offensively you know we had to become more more explosive from the perimeter um, you know we need more perimeter shooting and I failed the the team the year before by not constructing the roster properly and I wanted to address that while it was fresh in my mind um, so that's that's how we did it. The other coaches did not want me to do it. They thought I was too emotional to make decisions, but I knew exactly where we needed to go. Up front, just to the right of the aisle, Gavin. Uh, Gavin, Keith, New London Day. Dan, you, you, beginning of the season, you, you kind of questioned whether about your, how what your toughness was going to be like. How's that developed, and where is it now? Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I, I think we... It's listen. I, I don't know that this is like the toughest team I, I've coached, uh, but I think it's a pretty tough team. I think it's uh, a really hard playing team. That's part of our identity. Um, obviously, Andre Jackson gives you incredible toughness. No one plays harder than him. Adama Sonogo, you know, it gives you incredible toughness. Yeah, but I do think this team. It's 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 just a it's a balanced team. It, it's. It's a team that's really good on offense that has a lot of variety in what we do on offense. You know, we've, 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 we've refound our identity defensively. Um, you know, and, and, and we are a really good rebounding team, one of the best in the country. So you know what? Now that I say all that, yeah, this is a really tough team because you couldn't do all those hard things well unless you're really tough. So, We'll go back to the center of the room. Zach? 
No more St. John's questions, I promise. <laughs> um, why were you so certain you knew so fast soon after? Why were you so certain you knew what that, what, how you failed the team? And what was it just based off one or two games? I mean, how did you know? Yeah, it's just you, you, you just knew how hard it was at times for us to score because of spacing. Um, you know, the spacing in different positions didn't give Adama, you know, the room to operate in the post. Uh, there weren't driving lanes. You know, we weren't able to just play with as much skill as we play with right now. And, you know, just, you just, you, you felt it. That semifinal loss to Nova where, um, you know, we, we just, uh, you know, we, we, we just couldn't play well enough offensively. And I don't know how many points we scored in that New Mexico State game, but I know it was it was painful, uh, painful to watch, and it was my responsibility. And um, you know, so really, roster construction and, and getting the right personalities in your locker room is critical too. Those are the two things um, you know you, you learn, I think, every year on this job, and um, get better every year. In a moment, we're going to open things up to our full court press program. Is there a final question from the general media for Coach right now? We'll go up front to Dom. Dom and Maury Hartford Current, no, as Dom. you know. Uh, Dan, you just mentioned having the right personalities in, in the locker room. How would you describe or define the vibe of this team right now going into this game? Maybe how it's changed from a few weeks ago? or, or, or I mean, it almost, is it almost like the optimum of what a coach wants in a, in a vibe? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the, these guys are competitors. Um, come to UConn to do big things. I, I, it's a group that has a lot of confidence right now, but has you know, that, that strong respect for our opponent, Miami, um, you know, but also has, a, has that mentality where you know, we know the quality that we could get to on the court when we're, we're at our best, um, defensively rebounding, being the hardest playing team, and then you know, moving that ball offensively. It's just the group is very confident. And then just when you have guys like Andre Jackson and Donovan Klingon and, and, and Joey, uh, you know, it's just it's a Carab Caraban and Adama. It's just it's a, it's a live group. I mean, the guys are they're, they you know, they're, they're, they got a great vibe. Joey brought some of the California vibe, so that's good. The UConn locker room remains open for student-athlete availability. And as we welcome in Andre Jackson, Jr., we're now going to move to a question and answer period for coach and for Andre with the full court press program. So that's for our journalists with the black lanyards for the next 15 minutes. If you have a question and you're from our full court press program, raise your hand. We have a couple in the back. Let's go just a couple questions, couple uh, chairs in right there. Uh, Coach Sam Calhoun. Uh, so uh, this matchup with Miami features uh, really great guards on both uh, on both teams, and, and uh, Miami's got uh, three uh, those three guards for Miami. They they're three of the top six scorers in the NCAA tournament. How are you preparing for uh, how are you preparing for those three guards who can score at such a high level? Yeah, Sammy. Uh, pl you know, prepare without a lot of sleep, man. I got to tell you, it's uh, you know with uh, with Pack and Wong and Miller. It's just it's the greatest defensive challenge we've had this year because it's, you know, it, it's the best collection of guards we will have faced, um, you know, with, with Poplar who's playing great, and, and then maybe the best rebounding physical center, you know, that, that we've seen. So um, obviously, you know, we, we've got to force them, um, you know, to beat us more from the perimeter uh, over the top. We cannot allow them, you know, to get to the rim. We've got to avoid them. You know, getting to the paint and to the free throw line as much as possible. Um, you've got to keep them out of transition. We cannot have live ball turnovers. You know, we've we got to make them score five on five in the half court versus us um, and, and really shrink the court in places that we can shrink the court and be aggressive in places where we want to be aggressive. That same part of the room, Talia. Hey, Coach, Talia Goodman. Um, with three of your players participating in fasting for Ramadan, how does that? How do you navigate that as a coach? And if it does at all, how does it impact your decision making? Yeah, I, I think uh, nice to meet you, Talia. Uh, I, I think it's uh, you know, number one, I think it affects like how you maybe think about substitutions a little bit. Um, 
with maybe trying to maybe not give a Dama as long a run. Um, but uh, I think a lot of that just falls on, you know, the medical staff, strength and conditioning, you know, Coach, Ga Coach Gavin. And um, again, like I said, we have three doctors here and like two trainers. So they should be able to figure it out. Continuing to take questions for Coach or for Andre, we're going to go to the right of the aisle. If this question's not for Andre, the next question has to be for Andre. Hey, Coach. Uh, Peter Radicus. So, beginning of the season, you guys started off really hot, faced some adversity in the middle of the season, but now in the tournament, kind of been one of the most dominant teams, you know, throughout the games. How have you kind of, how have you guys kind of weathered that storm, and what's kind of been the key to that dominance so far? Yeah, We've got a great locker room. You know, we got great culture. You know, you've, it started with some people be before Andre, right? This was like uh, uh, Isaiah Whaley and, and Christian Vital and, and R.J. Cole and, you know, Tyrese Martin, some Tyler Polly helped build a, a culture to get this thing going. And then they, they passed the leadership mantle on to, to this man over here. And uh, you know, he just kept that team together. You know, Andre's equal parts like, you know, um, lift people up and then, also ripped there, you know, you know what? I mean, he's a, he, he's a high level leader and, he, and he, he's got all the tools in his bag. So uh, this guy kept the locker room together, he kept the team together when we were struggling. Um, and that's how we were able to come out on the other side. To the left of the aisle, question for Andre. A uh, question for both uh, Coach and Andre. Uh, John Morgan, SMB Daily Campus. Uh, so you guys entered the tournament as a four seed. Um, Having to knock out some higher competition, but since then, um, it just what's been a crazy tournament so far. See yourselves as the highest remaining seed, with some people calling you the favorites in this tournament. Has there been any sort of mindset shift in the locker room, or just looking to maintain that same mentality you've had all season? Andre, I still feel like we're the underdog. I feel like we've been that the entire year. Uh, I feel like we came into the season, and a lot of teams, a lot of a lot of people just underrated us, and we still play with that same chip on our shoulder. We're going to extend another question to the right of the aisle. Lindsay Plotkin, The Daily Texan. This is a question for both of y'all. How has the rest of the locker room and the rest of the players on the court picked up if there has been any slack from Adama and the other players that are fasting currently? Andre first. Um, I think everybody is ready to just step up in whatever position that they need to. I think we got a lot of guys with a lot of experience, so everybody's ready to really step up when, whenever it's necessary. But I think Adama has done a really good job up until this point with fasting and also being able to play. So um, I think all the guys have done a great job of stepping up in their, in their roles and in their positions. Coach, if you have anything to add, if not, though. Yeah, I think Andre said it. I think it's, uh, it's a group that stepped up for each other the whole year. And... Uh, Let's go toward the back. Four seats in. Uh, Coach, uh, like you said, uh, UConn's one of the toughest teams and one of the best rebounding teams in the country. You talked about North Child of uh, being one of the best defensive rebounders UConn will face all year. How do you match North Child's physicality and ability to pour to pull down boards while just being like six foot seven? Yeah, I mean, listen, if, if, if you stand upright against him, if you don't get a uh, uh, real low leverage, uh, he'll absolutely uh, he'll bury you. Um, yeah, I haven't seen a rebounder, you know, go after the ball and track it and trace it and and positional and, and then you know, he he really attacks the ball like his life depends on it. So um, you know, obviously our, our centers have a tremendous challenge, Adama and Donovan. But then guards also have to get in there too. Um, you know, you have a chance to to you know get down there and chip him. And, uh, and make it challenging for him to get to the ball with two people. You've got to take advantage of doing that as well. Continuing with questions for Andre or Coach, this is for our full court press program. Those are journalists with the black lanyards at this time. All the way back and all the way left. Let's raise your hand, make sure we can see you. Mantra Dave, um, Daily Texan. Uh, for both of y'all, again, in their last game in the lead eight, um, Jordan Miller had a perfect game, um, Christian Leitner level performance. What are y'all going to look to focus in on to make his life a little bit more difficult um, and kind of force him into taking some tougher shots? <laughs> yeah, um, listen, it, it's, it's tough because you know, he's a three level scorer. Um, you know, he's, he, obviously he's lefty, he's slippery, he's super skilled, um, and he could also really pass the ball. So, um, you know, you just you have to make his catches as difficult as you can um, and, and show him a lot of different looks. I think against, you know, teams when you get to this point, 
it's the best of the best could survive a tournament like this and get to a Final Four. So, you know, we're going to have to show you know, him multiple looks. One thing that he sees, you know, for an extended period of time, he, he's going to eat it up. So, you know, we're just going to have to mix things up and make things as tough as we can on him because he's a great player and, and he's probably one of the most underrated players in the country. Andre, anything to add from a player's perspective? No. Thank you, Andre. Left to the aisle. Uh, uh, coach, you'll be playing a Miami team that's come off of two very different styles of games, one against Houston in which they were forced to shoot from the perimeter, hitting 11 threes, uh, one against Texas where they didn't make a three in the second half and only shot eight in total. Uh, what type of game are you looking to get this Miami team into uh, to help your team with a better chance? Yeah, I, you know, obviously you go in with a game plan without getting in, into too many specifics. Um, you know, there's things that are that relative to our identity. There's a style of play that we've established that, you know, that we're going to stick to. Uh, obviously, you know, from a game plan perspective, you know, you, you don't want to give up a lot of, like, rim twos. They're an excellent driving team, um, and, and we can't foul them. You know, we, we do not want to put them at the free throw line. You know, so, you know, beyond that, uh, I can't invite you all the way into uh, – <laughs> yeah, I got you. <laughs> Uh, right of the aisle, third row. Hey, Coach. Uh, Henry Huber, LSU Reveille. Uh, you're facing one of the more tenured coaches in the, in the country, and Jim Laranega. Uh, just what are your thoughts on him, and have you all smoke, spoken at all uh, prior to this matchup? Yeah, I've known Coach for a while. He's uh, you know, a Malloy guy and a you know, New York City guy, and you know, my dad. And you know, obviously, us being in basketball our whole lives, we've known him for a long time. Um, I mean, I got a lot of respect for Coach and and his career and um, and the way his his teams have played and the fact that he's gotten to this Final Four multiple times in his career speaks to, to his quality and uh, I got to know him on Adidas trips when I was at Rhode Island and he was obviously you know with Adidas as well and uh, you know we developed a friendship and um, you know and he's been good to me in my career so obviously we want to beat each other's brains in but. Uh, obviously, there's a, I have a big, big amount of respect for him. Toward the back of the room, right of the aisle. Uh, hi, for, uh, I'm Hannah O'Yara, and this question is more for you, Andre. Um, you guys have obviously been dominating this tournament. You steamrolled through Gonzaga. So do you feel like there's been a different energy or different routines for this tournament, or do you feel like you've just hit your stride as a player? I think we all hit our stride, and we all understand like what's what's behind it. We all know that you lose one game and your season's over. So we're playing with a desperation that it's like nothing we've played before. So uh, every single time we go out there, we know it could be our last. So really trying to do every single thing possible to really stay out there on the floor and and continue this ride with each other. Next question comes from the right side of the room, four rows back. Uh, this is for Coach. Uh, Coach, you've had a lot of you've had five years of experience playing college basketball. Um, do you? use the experiences that you had to try and help the players share some stories that you had and also um, you had family so can, can you tell me if you use some personal experiences to help the players yeah no, a great question man uh, yeah I, I think a lot when I when I coach the guards and you know when I give them you know little bits of, of things to look for that I saw as a player you know when you grow up as a point guard and your dad's a Hall of Fame coach you know, and, and your brother's a, a two-time national champion and seventh pick in the draft, who's one of the all-time, you know, Kamani argues with me on this, but my brother's the greatest or most decorated point guard in college basketball history, if not the greatest. So just being in that household, you pick up a lot of, you know, the, the intricacies of, of, of great guard play or understanding the game in general. Um, I, try, I try not to draw on too many of my experiences as a player, uh, I try to draw maybe a little bit more on just my experience as a coach. I've been a coach for a long time now, uh, almost 30 years. So, um, yeah. And my brother, I asked him just a little bit on the way out. I asked Bob about the Final Four, just going from, you know, his, his freshman year when they played UNLV was the last year they played it in an arena. And then that, that following year it was in the, it was in the, uh, the stadium uh, or the dome, excuse me, in Indy, just what that difference was like. So, this question and answer period has maybe one more minute, and it's for the full court press program. 
That's those journalists with the black lanyards on. Is there another question from Full Court Press? Let's go right back here, and maybe we'll wrap things up after that. Uh, Andre, just want to hear what, what's your favorite thing about Coach? Uh, I love a lot of things about Coach. I think probably probably the standard he holds us to. Uh, every single day, it's just like you got to bring your best because if you don't, like he's going to let you know. And it, It's always great when you have somebody that holds you to that standard because you know that you're going to get better in an environment like that. So I'll probably say that's my favorite thing, even though sometimes it's my least favorite. <laughs> I was going to say, like, if that's his favorite thing about me, that's crazy, right? <laughs> I think we'll wrap things up while Andre still you know, make sure that it was a good one. Thank you very much, Andre, and thank you to Coach Hurley. They're going to go out to the floor with the rest of the UConn Huskies, and they're going to do their open practice at 2 p.m. That's coming up in about 15 minutes. That'll conclude activities here in the main interview room for today. We will be back tomorrow with our Naismith Hall of Fame presentation, with our AP Coach and Player of the Year presentation, our Oscar Robertson Player of the Year presentation and then of course the post game after the national semifinal games we'll be right back here with our uh, advancing teams and our teams that will not advance we'll see you back here tomorrow thanks everybody Life with a four-year-old and a one-year-old.